as well, saying that they feel Cloud9 is the second best team here, but we are underway. Absolutely. You could hear the crowd getting hyped downstairs, and we are into draft. Yeah, that Arden ban is great from Cloud9. That, they did their homework because your European teams love that Arden. <laughs> Lara is then banned on B-side, which is a typical and a predictable ban from EU. So it's interesting that they went and, and went with the prediction there. And of course, they're yes. going to take Koshka here. The Koshka first pick. How big of a deal is this for SK, that American Koshka? This is massive. I mean, we are finally going to see. The, the difference in the win rates was so drastic yes. in the regular season with North America having an over 80% win rate on the Koshka. Now we find out, is North America better at playing it? Or is Europe better at playing against it? One of the big things, though, in favor of SK is they have banned one healer and they've picked the other. So yep. you can't have that Koshka healer combo. Yeah, and Grumpjaw is actually a good counter into Koshka here. So it's a, I was surprised that Cloud9 did not ban Grumpjaw away because Grumpjaw can face Koshka in that early game. So Cloud9 will probably most likely take Gwen because Old School is su such a great carry on that Gwen. Oh, they actually go with Vox. And I think for support-wise, they have a few options such as um, Finn, for example, or they can go with some more aggressive like Flicker. But I think here, what makes the most sense, maybe potentially Calf, because Calf can counter Grumpjaw or Glaive even, in terms of putting him out of position and canceling his ultimate. Yeah, I think the Catherine would be absolutely massive here for them to pick up, because you do, again, you need to be able to cancel out that Grumpjaw ultimate. They're going to go with the Glaive, though. Yeah, and I feel like that's, this is very important to highlight the fact that we were getting to a part where the captain pool is actually really not that wide in that situation. <laughs> SK have done a good job of kind of pinching that pool down, but now looking towards SK's final pick, how do you round out this composition? Yeah, they can go with Flicker if they play at Fortress. There's a lot of options. They can do uh, Finn um, with Grumpjaw. That's a very strong combination. Uh, they can also do a Captain Grumpjaw, but I doubt it because they want to match against the oh. Oh, Batiste. Here it is! We mentioned it earlier. <laughs> we are going to see Batiste coming into play. Do we think this is a Captain Batiste? Absolutely, because you want know. you want a weapon power of the Grumpjaw to match okay. the Koshka, okay. and it's definitely going to be a Captain Batiste here. So super I'm quickly. If it's Captain Adachi. <laughs> okay, well we'll get into that when we get into the game. Really quickly, who do we think has got the advantage here? Ooh, if SK can execute their draft, I'm going to give it to them, honestly. Okay. I still think North America over Europe. I think Cloud9's got it. Okay, divided desk on this one. It's time to pass over to our casters. Jaws and Excoundrel, take it away. <laughs> I don't know, people keep doing that. Yeah. I just wonder if, it, I wonder if it's a thing that I just don't get. We thought of the copy then. But yeah. <laughs> my name is Jaws, obviously joined by Excoundrel. And we're into game number one with our EU versus NA on day number two, Cloud9 versus SK Gaming. And my goodness, have we got a game number one. I mean, I was looking at this draft phase thinking, all right, I'm expecting something weird from SK. I'm expecting them to bring out a little bit of spice in this first series, but oh my word, that is a draft that I have just never seen before. Mind ticking away, thinking about what they are going to achieve. And I actually think it's a pretty solid plan against the Koshka. Um, I, I think, you know, you have that Batiste to lock that Koshka down, the early aggression, the Ordained comes out, suddenly Koshka can't make use of her movement speed, she can't be, you know, really tricky in the early game, and Grump your weapon power, like Suijay said, very good at dealing with Koshka, matching her toe to toe in terms of early aggression. Yeah, like Grumpjaw's just base, uh, base damages as well. Just they're insane. Yeah. Like almost like you said to kind of match Koshka, right? And then you got Baptiste in the jungle as well to kind of help him along, or in the Roma position, I should say. Yeah. It's just going to be an absolutely ridiculous mashup. We've got two of the newest yeah. heroes coming onto the fold. SK Gaming, they're like, okay, we're just going to bring it all in this first one. Game number one, though, we're on to the fold. Glaive and a Vox in the lane, though. This is kind of what something I've wanted to see as well, because Gabe Vizzle, people have been talking about him time and time again. What a fantastic captain he is, and I want to see him match up against Kavalafar. Here they go, SK making an aggressive move here. Scout Trap will be able to sort of ward off and keep that lane earlier, but this is an inv invade coming out from the entire SK squad. And looks like Cloud9 are going to respond by shoving that lane up incredibly hard, with both Old School and Gabe Vizzle doing the work there. By shoving the lane up, you do punish SK slightly. They do lose lane minions to the turret, and obviously, in that case, it means you kind of lose a bit of gold efficiency in your invade. And Gabe Vizzle, being Glaive, is going to make his move to the back of the SK jungle and start to do a similar thing. Yeah, and I can imagine what we're going to see here from um, from Jetpacks at least. It's just to disrupt this Koska as much as he can. Tyros, he's this he's this rookie player, first live event, and he was talking to us saying how he's so excited to play on stage. And coming up with such a titan that is Cloud9, I'm kind of like curious to see how he's actually going to uh, 
you know, react in this sense, because Mouse Sports, you could say it was more or less going to be a 3-0 from the get-go. Yeah, Vizzle's going to walk straight into SK here, but SK not overly fond of trying to make that committed play right now. They're just going to continue farming. Looks like it's been a fairly even trade across it so far for C9 and SK. C9 did respond really well to the SK early invade. They, again, like we said, they shoved the wave. So obviously you're getting farm already over onto old school and Gabriel did a really good job of putting pressure in the back jungle. But here come SK once more. Another three-man roam. Another three-man though. They're just not, they're just completely ignoring the lane. Ordain's going to come down. Gabe is also going to get stunned up. If he does leave, it doesn't end up doing it. After burns away, I know Josh is going to be kind of safe out there, but SK Gaming, they want to take the fight to Cloud9. Is this maybe over aggression from SK right now? They are committing a lot of resources to try and make these plays in the enemy jungle. Cavalifar is yet to have time to farm in lane. He's already 16 CS behind old school I love the idea from SK but maybe it's a little bit too much down that line too much trying to counter NA at the very early stage of the game. Well, Kvalifar's in a lot of trouble here. <laughs> Cloud9 just jump on him and grab first blood. Old school as well with that kill was going to be that's going to be huge for him. The amount of time he's had to farm plus this early goal from the kill it's going to be pretty big and we all know what happens when a late game box comes about. Yeah I, I think you had this duo from SK that was the Batiste and the Grump draw. I think that worked really well as a duo jungle. If I Love Joseph was going to find aggressive moves, if Gabe Vizzle was going to find aggressive moves, especially, imagine this, Gabe Vizzle committing with an afterburn or Dane comes down and suddenly he's stuck there, you know, in the midst of that SK lineup and he becomes a real sitting duck. But the problem is Kavalafar spent a lot of his time supporting his team, trying to find those aggressive moves. And I guess they were hunting for first blood. They were hunting to potentially pick someone off in the early game, but it's all gone wrong in the first sort of couple of minutes here for SK because C9 are the ones that pick up first blood. Old School's already farmed. He's uh, already hitting those tier sort of two item spikes oh, with the Tyra's heavy steel. Tyra's in a lot of trouble here. Afterburn is actually going to stun him up. Old School's going to join them as well. He's in a lot of trouble. Hangry over the wall. Doesn't quite make it. And Cloud9 pick up their second kill of the game. And who better to have it on than Old School? I feel like this is just a... Uh... SK now kind of lost their early game plan, didn't quite work out for them, and now they're struggling to know actually where to have an impact. Looking at uh, Lila Joseph now, has found an aggressive move here. Jetpack's doing what he can to try and defend this, but again, level differences are quite different. Does use the Ordain. I love Joseph's trapped in there. SK Gaming are now marching down their jungle. Can they do anything here? There's a lot of mobility from C9. Tyrus is having to make a forward heads up play. Old School going fairly low. They're going to jump back in on them. A bit of a skirmishing going Ooh, on. Tyrus jumps one. in. That's too big for him, though, as Joseph does take him out. And now they're in a lot of trouble. Ordain comes through, and Jetpacks is going to be able to secure that kill. Do manage to trade one for one, but Cloud9 yet again seems to come out on top. Gavalafa, a little bit low in energy there. I like what SK were trying to do. They were trying to sort of punish again. That was exactly what I think their composition is designed to do. Punish that aggressive move. Kind of shut down the mobility of a very mobility-dependent composition from Cloud9. Because we haven't yet talked about what these comp compositions are designed to do. Obviously, going to get too much time because there was so much action at the start. But you have a look at what... Cloud9 are brought to the table. They've got super aggressive moves. They can obviously commit very hard as both Koshka and, and Glaive. You can try and focus down a singular target, particularly Adagio, pretty weak to that particular combination. But they've also got good peel there as well. Gabe Vizzle going to be eventually moving towards some cooldown reduction, a bit more utility focused on this Glaive. He'll be looking to peel for old school. And that's where my worry comes in for SK's composition. If you don't get ahead early, you can get kited so easily with what SK have brought to the table. You've got a low mobility Grump Jaw, although he's got a dash, he's not particularly mobile otherwise. Kavalafar might die here. Kavalafar, he's got the heal on him, but it's not going to matter. Old School comes in once more for another kill. I mean, this is going to be the problem here for SK with Old School with three kills on the board already. Look how much gold he has 2,500 gold. He's going to go back. He's going to finish his Zora Blade. Actually, take that back. Actually, pick up some Poison Shiv first item. Great. I love the Poison Shiv here. I think the healing is super critical to the way that SK need to play. Remember, if you commit your um, Grump Jaw, you commit your Batiste. They are sitting ducks, and if you then take the healing out of the picture for Adagio, suddenly they are much easier to take down, much easier to deal with, and SK suddenly might be finding themselves in this first game very seriously behind. I think this is a big matchup that I wanted to talk about as well, this matchup between Kavalafar and Old School. I think Kavalafar would be one of the first to say that maybe mechanically he's not quite on that level that Old School is. Old School really is that level above. Uh, and he seems to be getting exploited quite early here by those aggressive moves from Gabe Vizzle and Old School being able to follow up on them. SK just, I think I like their draft. I think I, I liked what it was supposed to do, but C9, if 
If SK didn't win the early game, C9 just run away with it, and it looks like they are starting to do so now. I mean, Ordain does actually stun a pile of Joseph here. Tyrus is going to come in, just gets knocked back with the afterburn, though. Cloud9, I mean, the thing is, right now, you've got to think, put this up uh, on the board. Joseph, he's got the level 6. He has got the Yummy Candy Frenzy available to him. And also, more importantly, that is a prime example of what I meant by the ability to kite this SK composition. As soon as Tyrus commits after Burns away, they've suddenly got nothing to chase C9 down, and you've got a hyper-mobile carry laner like the Vox, a very mobile Koshka who, despite what most people think, doesn't have the worst drop-off in the late game either. You know, I don't know if SK have what it takes to chase down C9. All you need to do is gate Vizzle to after burn Grumpjaw, and then suddenly Vox is kiting for days. If you can't get within ultimate range, and like we said, even if you can, Gay Vizzle has been known to be able to crucible those Grumpjaw ultimates, it will be very difficult to deal with old school for SK. Oh, another afterburn comes in. Does land to Jetpacks, repositions him, but they can't really follow that up. Joseph once more, Yummy Cat Frenzy available to him. Bad Mojo flying out, or Dane's gonna come through as well. Old School's actually caught up here. Jot Grumpjaw's gonna dive over the wall, Versus Jetpacks is gonna come down, but not before they pick up one kill. I love Joseph Falls, Old School in a lot of trouble. There's the stuff from SK. Tyrus going to turn that into a 1v3 situation, but Gabe Vizzle is actually just going to afterburn away. Yeah, I mean, that was an easy one for Gabe Vizzle, but SK played that really well. They used the Ordained onto Old School. He couldn't commit and couldn't get to that back line to deal with Kavalafar, and suddenly then Tyrus turns onto that critical target of Isle of Joseph. Gabe Vizzle trying to be a nuisance here. Might be able to put a bit of pressure onto this gold oh, miner, but does get ordained. ordained though, stun. He does have to burn away. We've got to keep that in mind. Gold miner is going to go over to SK. Joseph hops over the wall to that tree and gets the healing, but can't really match SK. So people who are fairly new to Batiste might think, why is he being played in the captain role? Why is Batiste good in a captain position? Well, he has an ability called Ordained, which is his B ability. And what that allows him to do is essentially put down a small area that a, 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 a target member or target uh, enemy can't really move out of. And that synergizes really well with big, heavy-hitting melee bruisers. And as a weapon power grump jaw, you are exactly that. You are a big, heavy-hitting melee bruiser. It complements low mobility heroes, because instead of boosting your hero's mobility, it reduces the mobility of your target, effectively doing the same thing. So that is why you sometimes see Batiste being thought of in these compositions. Here we go again. SK may be looking for a little bit of a duel here against C9. Oh, Taurus does have stuff available. He does hangry in. I love Joseph's going to get repositioned. Gabe Vizzle in the middle of all of them. I love Joseph's still surviving somehow. A kill already goes forward to old school. Kavalafar's going to fall as well. Jetpacks, the last one to go down. Double kill comes through for Gabe Vizzle. Absolutely massive. There's just a clump of health bars and you just saw SK falling. And stuff not even used by Tyrus, by the way. Didn't have the opportunity to find a target for it. Went straight in. Kavalafar, I think if you choose to take that kind of fight, I think Kavalafar, especially as a CP Adagio, needs to have his ultimate available. Now, there was this big theory that we talk about with CP Adagio. When you have alternating current, is it worth it or more efficient to just try and get basic attack damage down, or do you channel your ultimate? In that situation, had Kavalafar channeled his ultimate, it might have been a saving grace for SK and allowed them to potentially turn the fight. I think you need all of your cooldowns, all of your big hitting abilities available for SK to actually take on a fight here. I think without that verse of judgment, Kavalafar potentially was in a lot of a, a, a far weaker position because obviously Gabe has all singled him out as an afterburn target. If you get afterburned as an Adagio, the best thing you can do is heal yourself and use your ultimate. In a lot of situations, you know, six or seven times out of ten, that's going to get you something. And I think Kavalafar would have had a lot more success if that was the case right there. Oh, now Cloud9 are just pushing towards this lane. Jeff is actually using the boots to come in. Or Dane is actually going to get blocked by old school. So maybe this is going to be the problem now for the impact that Jetpax can have with that Ordained. As soon as these reflex blocks comes out, Ordained is a little bit useless. Yeah, but it does force a reflex block, remember? So you also have other abilities on the side of SK Gaming that you will be tempted to have to try and use that um, reflex block for. Remember, you do have the... Oh, here we go. Oh, fight. I don't know. There's a fight coming on right now. Kavalafar in the back line just going to get chunked out. Wait for it. It's actually going to silence three members there. It's going to be really big. But the stuff is going to find Gay Fizzle, but it's not going to matter because Tyrus already falls. It might just be a one for one trade. His old school's in the front line, but it doesn't matter. He's still surviving as they do afterburn in. And Ace comes through for Cloud9 once more. How does this keep happening? That was a situation where you don't use your burst of judgment. <laughs> you just saw one of the members of C9 get taken into the Grump Jaw belly and then you charge your verse of judgment right on the edge of where C9 worked. Kavalafar would have been a lot better just slamming those basic attacks down in that situation but C9 played that fight really really well in, in and dealt with the cards that they were given you know they managed to kite backwards they didn't overcommit to that crystal sentry which is a massive deal to have to fight up against and I think uh, SK just made a massive mistake the way they attempted to play that fight right there.
Well, we've seen from the American teams already that as soon as they get the lead, they can hold it. And even some of the EU teams were saying that exact phrase. They were saying, okay, so when the North American teams, they take an early turret, they can rotate to our jungle, they can take our fronts. Like, it's extremely hard for us to come back, and North American teams are very, very good at holding that and then pushing yeah. forward. And we're seeing that just here. Three turrets from main for SK. It's not looking good for them thus far. I mean, they just need to crack that first turret on the side of Cloud9. And also, you've seen time and time again, SK have looked for potential fights, but all it has taken is one afterburn from Gabe Bizzle to shut that down, with Tyrus being the only gap-closing hero that is kind of available for SK. He gets not knocked back. SK then have to rely on Cloud9 to make the move. They can't actually find their own initial engages, which is, I think is why movement speed is so important to the SK lineup, which is why Jetpacks, I think, ideally should be searching for war treads ASAP, but he's a little bit behind on items right now. Gabe Vizzle's two items oh, ahead of him. Gabe Vizzle, he does after burn. Cavalifar, Cavalifar has got versus Joseph available, but yes, Yummy Candy Frenzy does end up blocking it. First round's on three people. I love Joseph falling really low in the front line. Just going to dash forward. Twirly Death finds the kill onto Jetpacks. That's going to be another after burn reposition on Tyrus. He's going to dash forward, though. He gets the kill, at least on old school, but it's still going to be another ace for Cloud9. Three back to back aces, only losing one member. Uh, the sustained damage from Cloud9 is just there right now. They weathered the potential early hiccup that SK tried to throw their way. And suddenly you've got old school and three damage items. But you need to just look at those item discrepancies. It, it, the items tell you the entire story here, Jaws. It's three tier three items and Aegis completed for old school. Kavalafar now only just completing his broken myth. Tyra is at two items, an item that spikes a little bit earlier as well. Gabe doesn't trying to get taken down by the Ordain, but... He should be pretty safe here. He'll be able to afterburn over the wall in just a second. Yeah, Bad Mojo is going to slow him up. Is he going to do it? There he goes. <laughs> I was, I was he steals, he steals yeah. the back camp as well. He just swags out of there, <laughs> taking that healing camp from the back and says, all right, guys, no worries. All right, cheers, cheers for starting that one for me, lads. Yeah. I'm going to take this one and peace out. C9 just doing exactly what I think a lot of teams expect them to do incredible dominance in this first game. I think SK had a good idea in the draft phase, but the execution, especially in those first two to three minutes, was so punishing for them because it allowed old school such a free lane as well. Kavalafar was never really in the lane because he spent so much time roaming as a three-man with SK. It's so important as a laner to have that gold income. You can't really give your opponents quarter, and I think SK gave them, well, not only a quarter, but probably a half. Yeah, probably about half the game. I mean, one thing I want to touch on as well, SK, their mentality. They've been speaking about it a little bit and they do feel it's really strong right now and being a best of five is something you've got to kind of think about and yeah. process and the fact that if you do lose the first game, not too much of an issue. It's not a best of three. You don't have to work back in the two. You don't have to win the next two games to win the series. You can drop a game. You can see yeah. what um, C9 wants to bring to the table and then work from there. Their mentality shouldn't be shooken in that regard. Yeah, no, doesn't I agree, but see. Doesn't lie, it's going to be another fight there, so I'll just take straight back over again. Gabers actually does jump straight in again. Once more, versus Justin does come down because the massive science comes through. There it goes, but I'm not sure he's going to be able to get it off as Twirly Death finished off the kill. Isle of Joseph jumping in once more. Jetpack's kind of useless. Afterburned away, and Gabe Fizzle once more comes up massive as Joseph takes two kills. Old school takes one, and in fact, doesn't like they're just going to be able to end here. It's down I just can't believe. Cloud9 bringing such a force in game number one. I mean, they were given every opportunity to accelerate this game plan for themselves, and they did so with ease. SK had a good idea, didn't manage to execute it. And what's more, I guess, distressing for European teams is that SK was the team that North American teams were saying we respect. We said SK could be the, the real problem for us. SK could be the European team that actually finally finds a win in a series versus a North American team and Cloud9 just tossed them to the side. That was not even close. There was no competition in that game. There were, hands down, C9 were the definitive winners there. That was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like it's the analyst's turn <laughs> to uh, break the game down even further. But yeah, can SK Gaming come back? That is the question. And I want to hear from Munchables and the guys. Uh, back for the second time now. This, um, But yeah, wow, what a game from Cloud9. We went through the draft. It looked like SK had a great draft. It looked like everything seemed to be looking up for Europe. They were confident going in. Didn't really translate to the game, though, did it? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, yeah, I think SK made a big mistake when they overly focused on jungle and let Old School kind of take it away in lane. 
I felt like they didn't need a Daju to support them to invade Koska. Grumchop at T should be enough to handle the Koska, and I felt like they overly focused and sacrificed their lane to for jungle net early game. Yeah, I mean, you can see it there on your screen, the difference in CS between Old School and Kavalafar. At almost 10 minutes in, Kavalafar was sitting at 45 CS. He was so far behind because of the way that early game played out. But to me, part of this was also SK sort of testing the waters. And they, they, Cloud9, you just gave them Glaive, Kashka, Vox. That is like right up their alley. I mean, Vox is their most played hero. Glaive is their third most played hero. And then Kashka, you know, they were part of that Kashka train when she had 20 plus games in a row of an undefeated streak in North America. So I feel like part of this was SK saying, okay, we want their best. We want to see how we can deal with what is arguably one of the best compositions okay. that can be picked up by a North American team. So you feel like SK really testing the waters in this series. And I mean, it is best of five. Let's remember that they are not out of the series just yet. Still two more wins mm -hmm. need to be acquired by C9 before they move on in the tournament. But looking at that game then, what was it in game that really needs to change for SK? How do they go about changing up their playstyle? Does it need to be more focused on the jungle from all of the players, or is it like a single player problem? Just understanding like Cloud9 really takes it away when Old School is so ahead in lane. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch every game that they win, Old School is always dominant in lane. They're ganking the enemy laner constantly, they're shutting the laner down. And because of Old School getting ahead on items and builds and defense, he just hard carries in the late game. So SK needs to shut down Old School. Not only that, but if anyone knows how to deal with an Adagio in lane, it's going to be Old School. Like, he is one of the best, if not the best, lane Adagio in the world. And so that was why when we saw the draft, I was like, it, maybe it will be a uh, Captain Adagio because you just you don't want to put that against Old School because he knows how to deal with it. No, I, now we've seen SK lose a game, right? This is the first game they've lost this entire tournament. They've been coming in confident. They've been arguably cocky almost coming into these games. Do we think that losing this game is going to knock that confidence? Do we think that there could be a factor of tilt moving on forward in this series? I don't think so. Uh, again, because of the way that draft planned out, I, I feel like it was just them sort of trying something, just sit, being okay. You know, let's see if we can beat this, then we know we can beat anyone sort of thing. Uh, I think they're going to come into game number two with a much better draft, and it should be a much closer game as well. What about you, Sweet Jay? Do you think that this is going to knock them all? If they don't change their early game, then it's going to continue to be Cloud9's favor because mm -hmm. early game is all about farming and getting the level lead so you get the power spikes quicker. It's not about overly focusing on one objective and missing out on the lane objective. All right, well, we do have a replay from in that game, and honestly, most of the replays from in this game are pretty one-sided. <laughs> Yeah, this was one of the first aces at the 8 minute 3 round. And look, watch how the team focuses here. Gabe perfectly focused the Adagio. Look at the Crucible and the Fountain timing, like I said. Saves uh, Joseph from dying. And they just execute and focus. As soon as Adagio is afterburn, they just jump on him and, and blow him up. Yeah. yeah, not only that, but that, in that particular fight, Grumshaw wasn't even able to get his ult off. But when he did get those ults off, it still didn't even really seem to have much of an impact. Often there was a stun coming out immediately after from the Captain Glaive, or they were just able to you know move around the fight enough to make sure that having one person being eaten up did not actually negatively impact them too heavily. So do we think that this was an issue with something like the Batiste pick? Do we think that SK maybe needed to fight a little bit less in this specific matchup? I think there was a very clear objective with the Batiste pick. Batiste Grumchaw, because the Grumchaw went for it, that tension bow, they were looking to just isolate a target and yep. blow them up immediately. But again, just the execution was not there. Do you agree yeah. on that one? Yeah, and, and plus Batiste, his ultimate actually cancels other enemy ultimates. So when Kashka is stunning, you can actually fear, mm -hmm. do the fearsome shade on them and it'll cancel her ultimate. So there's a lot of things that they, they could have done to synergize that composition better. Maybe they didn't play it that much, but they wanted to pull it out to see how it would do against an NA Kashka composition. But it looks like it didn't work for mm -hmm. them today. So kind of micro mistakes in these fights. I think we have another clip to roll of a similar situation where in these fights, just small mistakes being made. Yeah, and again, this is all uh, that Kashka ult doesn't get blocked and then doesn't get canceled throughout. And that's a big mistake. The reflex block was just a little late. One other point I want to make was in almost all of these fights, the ultimates from old school, the wait for it, were so good. Constantly hitting 
almost the entirety, if not the entirety, of SK. All right, so moving on to the second game in the series. Are SK out for the count here? Is, are they going to come back from this one? Or are we expecting a totally different draft coming into this next game? Yeah, I think it's going to be a very different draft. I expect Kashka to be which. banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Koshka's off the table. Lyra going to be a standard second ban as well. Where do we go from here for SK? Yeah, they're going to probably pick up Arden here because they want that strong so, yeah. so captain that they are so dominant with. Cloud9 will probably take up the Lance. Um, there's also Gwen options. They actually go with Adagio. Um, and then potentially if they don't, if SK bans Lance, that's going to basically take away the Lance for the Adagio-Lance combo here. So how heavy priority is Grumptroll going to be in this track? Do we expect this to be another ban, or is it not as big of a deal now Koshka's off the table? I don't know if it's as big of a deal here. Uh, I think the Grump draw, I mean, if it does come through, it's very likely going to be from Cloud9. That's what they go ahead and take off the board. So SK now have to try and figure out what they want to prevent Cloud9 from getting their hands on. I would say their best bet is probably going to be that Glaive. Yeah, probably Glaive or Lance here coming out. I think they might ban the Glaive because Cloud9 plays it so proficiently. So it's either Lance or Glaive here, I feel, are going to be the bans that they want to go ahead and do. Yeah, so, and also they're both in a good spot, right, where they've picked up their captain. Both captains are very versatile anyway, so they shouldn't be in too much trouble looking forward. There is the Glaive ban that you yeah. mentioned. And now looking towards these last two picks, where did Cloud9 go? Uh, I mean, they could go for that Lance that uh, we were just talking about. It is a pick that they have played a, a pretty good amount, nine games of it during the regular season, but it didn't have the highest of win rates for them, which, I mean, it was still a, a positive win rate, 55%, mm -hmm. but it's kind of funny that 55% is one of the lower win rates that Cloud9 has with the hero. So what is it about Lance that makes him the, the best pick right here? What, what is it about him that fits most comps? Yeah, he has uh, he can root and then Githian wall stun in, into the wall. Oh, ooh, a Baron. Um, they're going to go ahead and pick Baron here. Uh, Baron is a great pick, however, there's Assassin's open. And with Arden and Assassin, like Blackfeather, Taka, it's really good onto that Baron. Okay. Um, so they got to be very careful here. Very aggressive composition out of SK, and the Black Feather comes through. That was banned last game by Cloud9. Taka, the final pick. This is the first Taka we see this entire tournament. Now, yep. I've been getting involved in the Vainglory community. I've seen a lot of memes about Taka. I've seen a lot <laughs> about Taka in solo queue. Talk to me about this pick a little bit. Taka, I mean, the memes exist about Taka because he's one of the most annoying heroes yes. to play against. I've uh, discovered that myself. <laughs> it's one of those situations where it always feels like your opponent's Taka is hard carrying while your teammate's Taka is just kind of being a potato. Licking but, windows. Uh, it's so, but here, Taka is one of the strongest counters to a Samuel. Okay. Uh, during the regular season, we saw teams constantly picking up the Taka and beating Samuel with it when Samuel was starting to really take Absolutely. over. So super quickly then, how do we feel the draft is going? Stop UCJ. I think the way Cloud9 is playing, I'm going to have to go with Cloud9. Okay. okay. Taka counters Samuel during the regular season. It's going to stay here. Okay, so two for Cloud9 on this one. We'll see how the casters feel as we pass it over for game two. Thank you very much, guys. No silly intros this time. Game number two is all serious. Cloud9 versus SK. SK, they're a game down right now, but we are seeing a Baron, and it's been hotly contested, both picked and banned, wherever possible, it seems. This is a really interesting draft phase for me because you've got SK, who have got all of their comfort heroes almost. You've got, you know, Arden. You've got Kavalafaz, Blackfeather. You've got Tyrus, Samuel. These guys know these heroes inside out. It is a very comfortable composition for them, but then you have this late-game timer, 4C9, you've got the Baron there, you have the Taka for old school. This is not just a Taka, sorry, for, uh, Joseph. This is not just a Taka, this is I Love Joseph's Taka. This is a guy who was famed. I remember when I first came into Vainglory, I was told to watch I Love Joseph because he's one of the best Taka players in the world. So this is I Love Joseph's Taka coming through here, and obviously then Adagio for, for Gabe. So this is going to be a pretty insane set of uh, team fights coming up from these guys. And remember, what Taka can do is put pressure on the Samuel earlier than a lot of other heroes could. Whether the storm of that early Samuel power spike having one of the most uh, powerful level two spikes in the game. So it's going to be really, really interesting. That it will. And one thing I want to point out as well, Jetpacks, he's got his Arden. It was banned away in the first game, and he's just performed spectacularly with it through the regular yeah. season. I mean, realistically, you're looking across the board right now, and you're thinking, okay, Joseph, Tucker, Jetpacks, Arden, Tyrus, he's on his Samuel. It's, there are just so many good comfort picks for these guys. Yeah. It's going to be such a close Close game. So sharing backs this time here for Cavalla for and Tyres, and it'll be Jetpacks coming into lane, trying to stop that early C9 push. 
Kvalifar will turn up. So taking their foot off that acceleration pedal have SK, deciding that obviously lane farm incredibly important. And I agree, I think that you, you do have to be aware that lane farm is, is a massive, massive thing in the early game. You can't give it up so easily that SK did last game. Kvalifar struggling to get the uh, farm under his belt though. Gabe Vizzle doing this really annoying thing where you heal the lane minion when they're trying to um, farm under turret. And not only does against the melee lane, and not only does that deal damage to them, but it also makes it very difficult to land that last hit. So it's going to have a, a, sort of a minor effect throughout the game, but it can be a, a little bit of a mental game for Kvalifar. If you're consistently missing CS, you can get a bit tilted. You can say, oh no, I'm missing CS, I'm missing CS. And you know, that could then snowball out of control. So it's a bit of a mental play there for, for Gabe Vizzle. Joker, uh, Joseph even is going to come around from the side here. Tyra's in a little bit of trouble. Samuel, strongest level power two spike in the game. He's going to jump straight underneath that turret. Takes a turret. He has a lot of damage. 200 to be precise. Drifting dark as well. Mass Invertix available to him. Gabe is on the side here, but Joseph's in a 2v1 situation. Does use the boost to get away. And in fact, Calvalifier has to retreat as well. Kaku for Joseph. Gabe Bizzle is going to meet him, so defuse that situation quite nicely. They're going to try and steal these backs as well. Not only have they been able to get away here, they're going to steal a hell of a lot of SK's jungle on the way out. And that is classic I Love Joseph right there. So you're going to stealth in. This is a bit of a bait right now. He's it is a bit of a bait. He's actually on the back line here. Kvalifar actually just pushing old school. Gabe Vizzle's fairly low though. So Kvalifar doesn't, he doesn't want to get too close to Kvalifar, I should say. Old school, backing off underneath his turret. It's not too much of an issue, but I Love Joseph looking to do something sneaky. Very messy early game here, by the way. All teams a bit over the place, SK. Not quite steady. Do you feel that they aren't yet feeling comfortable with the way that they want to approach this game? And C9 are just pulling out these cheeky little plays, which are keeping them in safe and also getting a bit of gold in the meantime. Pressure Ooh, here on the main Joseph's though. in a lot of trouble. Does use the heal to heal himself up. Taurus takes a little bit of damage from the turret. Joseph still surviving though. Old school as well. Isn't going to get taken down just yet. Kaku on the side. 26 HP on the side of our K Fizzle. That was disgustingly low. It was so, so close, but I Love Joseph has taken this opportunity to try and push into the enemy jungle. We'll have that Kaku available. Does steal the healing camp there. Oh, no. And Joseph will continue to wander throughout SK's jungle, doing what he can to steal things away. The Stormguard banner right now means he's going to get another one. He's going to have that Kaku too. Oh, that was close. On point, almost hit him. They're going to find him. Does use the boost to get away. It might be just be able to get out of here, but just jumps into Tyrus. Actually goes straight over him, and Joseph still ring a ring a rosy, he says, all around uh, SK's jungle. Meanwhile, though, if you look at the lane on the map, you can see they're just pushing this in. He got that as well. again, and he's still getting the healing caps. How is he still doing this? Gabe is going to be the F for the heals. Jeff is going to come through, though, but Tyrus, he's going to pick up first blood eventually after just being a run around just about yeah. five minutes. You might have got the kill, right? A first blood does give you that boon of gold, but you lost out on lane farm by committing Kavalafar. Joseph got every single camp there. Joseph picked up every single camp and wasted a good 45 seconds of SK's time running around the backside of their jungle. It, that is just insane from Cloud9. They're, they're, they're even able to get away with that. Even able to be allowed to get away with that. But despite that, Kavalafar keeping up a farm with old school right now, so SK pulling out a slightly better early game by tapering off that aggression and playing a little bit better to their win condition. But you obviously are seeing that Tyrus is not being able to exploit those early power spikes too heavily from Samuel right now because I Love Joseph making it very difficult. The level advantage is there for I Love Joseph as well because he has taken so much experience by stealing those camps too. Yeah, I mean, the thing is now he is level six. So let's jump into the Kaku once more. Titan to Titan jetpacks even. He's going to go underneath the turret once more. Like, he just keeps going under the turret over and over and over again. He knows he's got the regeneration from Gabe Vizzle available to him. Tyrus is going to come through to the lane as well. Cloud9 just hammering on this aggression. Kaku once more. Tyrus is going to be the target this time. Old School doing a lot of damage with those rocket launchers. Tyrus is going to have to be a little bit a little bit careful where he's going to kite back using that drifting dart. But Joseph's actually just going to solo out somebody. And in fact, Old School is going to go down a little bit too far forward. And Kavalafar and Tyrus are just going to be able to deal with them without too much of an issue. Baron very, very, well, not very mobile as soon as he's used his jump jets. Remember, the mortal wounds from Taka will shut down a bit of the Tyrus' healing, but not only that, Tyrus' uh, Dial of Joseph not yet level 6, so it doesn't have that instantaneous gap closed right now. Here we go. SK looking to put pressure under the turret. Drifting dark onto Gabe Vizzle once more. They're pressuring him now. They do manage to take out the kill. Tyrus picks it up. But Old School's going to be here as well. He just picked up his Sora, but he's got a lot of damage in his back pocket. Does have jump jets available to him, but doesn't want to go in. Not without the support from Gabe Vizzle. I think uh, C9 have been underestimating the power of the Arden Vanguard at this point in time. They are committing, thinking they're going to get the damage down. And then Jetpacks is bailing out those crucial members, giving the movement speed necessary to kite away for the Samuel. 
And obviously Samuel Sustain coming through with that Drifting Dark as well. SK off to a good start here versus C9. Not quite the dominance that we saw C9 have over SK in the previous game. But Kvalafar on this Black Feather, we know what he can achieve on it. Tyra's on this uh, Samuel, who has just picked up the Frostburn, by the way. So it's going to be easier now for Kvalafar to stick to his targets. But also, on the flip side, it's going to be easier for Tyra's to kite away from the likes of Isle of Joseph too. So, two sort of a, a double-edged sword to this Frostburn right now for Tyra's having picked this up. And Kvalafar also bringing sustain to the party with that uh, Serpent's Mask. I wonder if Old School might be tempted with a Poison Shift this game. It could be something to sort of alleviate and add more mortal wounds to this lineup for C9. I mean, it's an item we've seen growing in popularity on 2.4. See now. It's a nice little overview camera. Jeffax dives him onto Gabe Bizzle. Gabe is in a lot of trouble. Joseph's going to kite him straight to the back line, though. Gabe Bizzle in a heck of a lot of trouble, but it doesn't matter because Joseph's already taken out one. Gabe Bizzle going extremely low. There's the on point. There's the Blood Brothers. Four, <laughs> four Kavalafar ends up being oh, up the kill. But Joseph comes up. Big Kav Kavalafar shuts down old school he's got his number through and through old school is not getting a breather c9 ignoring kavalafar he's got that service match it's a big spike for him joseph taking lots of damage but again kaku comes through joseph so good at using that ability oh has got available to him just yet on points are gonna miss joseph sidesteps it kavalafar takes one too many hits from the turret decides to back off gabe is going to be here for the healing joseph does he want to go in again has got kaku give the bar as well to heal him up but decides not to if you want a 101 on how to play Taka, I Love Joseph is your man. He has unbelievable man and mechanical prowess on this hero, but let's not take away from what SK has achieved right now. Kavalafar, again, on his own comfort pick. And, and C9 are committing to these fights. They're committing their bodies, including old school, and you have to be aware of the execute potential of a, of a weapon power, uh, Black Feather. It's a really, really strong pick into a Baron because it can stick to him like glue. Baron has one chance to get away from danger, and that is with his jump jets. When he gets out there with his jump, that is his only way of then kiting away because he has pretty poor movement speed otherwise. Kavalafar with a double rose offensive, easy for him to stick to him, and he also has that execute potential of his A too. There you go, jump jets away. 18 second cooldown. Kaku for I Love Joseph, maybe looking for an entrance here, but on points and Malice and Verdicts from Tyrus and Kavalafar are just going to keep them at bay. Uh, Tyrus on about half HP now, SK Gaming. Mentality not shooken just yet. Forcing Cloud9 back, I mean, but to, uh, let's look at later stages of the game. I mean, old school, I'll interrupt myself real quick as Jump Jets is going to come out. He's going to jump oh, straight into the corner, though. Oh, my word, what was that? Stunning two more members as well. Kavalafar is going to come up pretty big. He's going to jump onto Isle of Joseph. He's in a lot of trouble. Doesn't have Kaku available. Kitan's in. Will he be able to find time? No, he wasn't, because Kavalafar is going to be there to secure the kill. Does end up trading one for one, however. Gape is all lost member alive for Cloud9. But Jetpacks, he's got the corner, and <laughs> this guy is on fire already. Jetpacks, what a beast, and now Gabe Bizzle is going to be the target. Can they find that executing blow? It looks like Kavalafar's going in. Yeah, he's going in. He does pop the reflex block. Is it in enough? I think it is. Old School's going to come up as well. Can't really do all too much damage, but that turret jump jets forward. In fact, he's going to do a lot of damage in a lot of space of time, and he gets one. Jump jets still on a 10-second cooldown, and Jetpacks is going to make it out nice and safely, but my goodness, Jetpacks if he lands more gauntlets like that, this game is over. Yeah, that was an insane gauntlet because the jump jet's already been used. Caught him at the very end. Didn't get the double basic attack off either. And then obviously Kavala was free to find an executing blow. But has this been a poor move for SK now because they've left their turret open? And now with Kavalafar down, I don't know if they can defend it. Here comes the Oblivion. Oh, Oblivion does actually sleep old school as he jump jets away. Kaku from Joseph to get out of there. But first turret does go down and it will be over to Cloud9. It's going to be a breaking point for Old School as well, so it doesn't feel like he needs the Poison Shiv. But I tell you, who has got the Poison Shiv? It's Kavalafar, and Joseph is the target Joseph again. Joseph in a lot of trouble. No Gauntlet, no problem. They're going to dash forward. They've got a lot of mobility on their side. Drifting Dark to help them out, but... Crystal Century and the rest of Cloud9 will be there to escort him to safe. So my one worry with this C9 composition, you kind of seen it the way that these fights have played out. There's no one really to protect apart from a heal from old school, uh, from Gabe Bizzle. There's no one really to protect. Looks like they want to commit to this uh, goal. Ion line. Cannon comes down, hits Jeb's axe, rocket lead forward, uh, jump jets even I should say forward. Tyrus in a lot of trouble there. Retreating Dark, healing him up. There comes the fountain and Tyrus already doing so much more. Gauntlet comes down, trapping three members of Cloud9 in. Versus is going to come through as well. Does end up getting blocked and now 
Cloud9 are pushing this trigger. They want to be able to take someone out. Joseph jumps straight back in, goes straight into Kaku. They manage to take out another. Ace comes through for Cloud9. And finally, they've got their foot in the door. Oh, big mistake from SK to make that play on gold by Kavalafar. Took too much damage right at the start. They should have been better off just disengaging and giving that over to C9. It was a mistake. They should have paid for it, but they paid for it in ounces now as well because C9 needed to pick up both that and the turret as well as stealing away some of the back camps. SK had a grab on this game, an absolute stranglehold on the way these fights were playing out, but C9 found their way back in through exploiting and good timing on their engage on that gold mine as well. They predicted how long SK might be spending on it, they waited and then they committed when they felt enough damage had already been done. They exploited that neutral objective doing a lot of work for them in that game and they did it excellently. And the thing is now as well, old school, he's just going to keep getting stronger. Yeah. Sora Blade, breaking point. I mean, you've seen what he can do in close corridors already with his passive, his rocket launcher. Th the problem is, if Cloud9 gets the latest stages of the game, I mean, Tyrus and Kovalafar, yes, they're going to have a lot of damage on their side, but the problem is, so's old school. And it, we've seen what he can already do on a Baron. Absolutely. Here in goes Isle of Joseph again. X Ratsu straight into the back line. Iron Cannon is going to come down straight in the middle of everything. Tyrus is separated now, but it's not going to matter. Old School is going to jump Jess out of it to safety. Oblivion comes down. It is going to get blocked. Tyrus in a 1v2 situation as Jetpax. Isle of Joseph is going to go for a 1-on-1 -on -one with Tyrus. He is going to get met with Jetpax. Jetpax is going to save, but it's not going to matter because Old School is going to come in with a jump Jess, pick him up. Jetpax is going to get chased down as well. X Ratsu on the back line. Tyrus does manage to get away using the boost, but Kaku isn't going to be. You're not going to be safe for long with that Kaku on Joseph. Is he going to be able to find him? Cyrus finally picks up the kill with another X Retsu. Jetpacks is going to get away, and Cloud9 even the score up at eight to eight. Buying these fights perfectly for them. Don't even have an Atlas Pauldrons yet, by the way. Old school picking up a coat of plates prevents a lot of that damage coming down from Kavalafar, making it harder now for Kavalafar to find those executing blows. That definitely not as easy as it was before. I do think SK Gaming have to consider an Atlas Pauldron soon, but so soon as the At Atlas Pauldron comes out for SK Gaming, Cloud9 are going to have one as well. So both Kavalafar and Old School are going to have a difficult time dealing damage in these fights. But realistically, these fights don't seem to be about Old School uh, or uh, Gabe Bizzle. These fights are about Isle of Joseph. He has been a monster. So difficult to get out of that Kaku. He's been very difficult to take down and has been finding those annoying executing blows, huge damage bursts with the build that he's got as well, having that Storm Crown and Aftershock already completed. Putting Tyra's way out of the fight. And look at this from Gabe Bizzle. He's brought an infusion and an alternating current to the table. He's now a damage threat in his own right. You have to respect that verse of judgment even more. Well, they want to fight. Gauntlet gets laid down from Jetpack first as well, but it's already a kill comes through for SK Gaming. They managed to take out Old School completely out of the fight. Now it's a 3v1 situation. They're going to push forward. That was over before it even started. That corner surrounded them all. The verse of judgment did nothing, and that was it. SK Gaming had won the fight. Yeah, they locked that Baron in there. Once Baron got, gets caught up, Easy money for Kavalafar to be able to take that one down. And this is a swinging uh, set of games there between these two. SK finding their way back in through a fight that when they've got these cooldowns available, they can focus down old school. And when old school's dead, realistically, a lot of the late game prowess and team fighting capability goes out the window. Maybe SK needs to turn around and say, let's ignore I Love Joseph the best we can. I Love Joseph doesn't steal it, but commits. Aku, he's got the x rays available. Doesn't want to go in. 2v3 situation right now with old school hiding around in the bush. It's like we're going to replay here and you can see... Yeah, he, he, jumps, he jumps straight into the gauntlet there. Damage went down. I don't actually think he got stunned. I think that was actually crucibled by Gabe Bizzle, so it was a great crucible. But the damage went through and also meant that he was easily targeted by Kavalafar then. It was a great engage by Jetpacks, again, on a hero that he's so comfortable on as well. Atlas Pauldrons comes through for Jetpacks. He's going to be able to put a lot of pressure down onto old school in these fights now as well. And Kavalafar's got armor, Tyrus has got armor. Everybody respecting the potential damage output of this Baron. Which, by the way, for those of you that aren't familiar with Baron, probably the highest single target or even splash damage output of any weapon power carry in the late game. He hits like a truck. So in a lot of ways, you do have to consider armor versus him. Okay, this is going to dash forward. Rocket actually jumped it straight from uh, old school. X Red Sue straight onto Tyrus. Tyrus melting. Use that drifting dart for healing, but it's not going to be a matter. Kavalafar is going to use the road offensive to get away. Gauntlet as well from Jetpacks. Big cooldown used for the disengage. But it was a fantastic time for C9 to search for the fight. Gabe Vizzle running in there, getting the slow. Kraken is available. And actually, they're going to go for this turret. They want that more so than the Kraken. Tyrus is going to be up in 13 seconds. Maybe the minions will do the work. Yes, they will. And now C9 might set up for this Kraken. Perfect. Cloud9 now rotating down now. Third turret for them. And they 
dissuaded in the early game. Not too much of an issue for them. They know they can bring it back with the old school, with the damage from old school. And uh, I love Joseph being able to just pick people off left, right, and center with that aftershock and storm crown as well. He's going to do a lot of damage to that kraken. They are starting it up and just releasing it over and over again. Kaku comes in, next red to on Kavala, far jetpacks, it is going to be there, Crystal Sentry is also going to uh, back them up just a little bit, and Tyra's as well on the side, and Cloud9 going back to lane pressure. I think that's what SK need to be careful about, because if they are stepping out of position, the punishing levels are so high from C9 because of the engaged potential of I Love Joseph, and now the fact that Game Fizzle is also a damage threat in his own right, here we go, Doesn't fight. like they want another fight, another jump jet straight in, straight into Oblivion, though it does get blocked up, old school, 2v1, he's still surviving because the rest of his team is just clearing this fight up, I Love Joseph finds Finds a kill onto Tyrus. He's going to jump straight on to Kavalafar. Rose defensive away. Just picks up Gabe Fizzle. Double kill for him. 2v1 now. And this is the problem. Joseph's alone. But we've seen what he can do. But he hasn't got much energy to work with. SK Gaming. They find another fight. And they make it work. And that was even without the gauntlet. Yeah, this is the problem I feel like that Cloud9 are having in the fights. We talked about everything that they've been doing right. But compositionally, there aren't many ways to protect your Baron in the late game. You've only got Verse of Judgment, which is CC. Other than that, there is literally no peel other than what Baron provides for himself. And that is a absolute dream field for a, a, a Black Feather. Black Feather can literally run in and no one is going to stop him. He can save Rose Offensive for only when he needs it to get through things like Verse of Judgment or to try to block damage. He doesn't need to be worried about a Lance, Scythian Wall. He doesn't need to be worried about CC from a Catherine. Anything like that is off his radar right now. And you're seeing Kavalafar go absolutely crazy in these fights. Ty Tyra's now is almost a utility-focused distraction. There for a Frostburn, and to keep Isle of Joseph busy while Kavalafa does work on that Baron. But Baron, at this point in time, I think Old School needs to look at the way he's positioning. He needs to be a more defensive. He needs to make Kavalafa come to him and use that jump jets to force Rose offensives from Kavalafa. Because right now he's jumping into Kavalafa, making it 10 times easier for SK to win these fights. Oh, Cloud9 have not scout trapped that brush. Here comes the gauntlet. Three members of Cloud9 now trapped in there. Old School is going to jump jets away, or at least try to. I believe he comes down, sleeps one, but already Kavalafa just deep with the barrel without too much of a problem. Double kill comes through. Is that a triple? It might just be. But I love Joseph still. He's still fighting. Grizzle Sentry there as well to help him out. But there's just too much ace. damage for Kavalafa. Ace comes through for SK. Kraken is open as well. Could this be game two going over to SK? Oh, it's looking very good for the European team right here. Myself and Jaws. Not biased, but rubbing our hands together. <laughs> it is good to see Europe step up to the plate given how well C9 played in the last game. They look like SK, they sure up that early game, don't make any silly over-aggressive mistakes, and suddenly they seem to have some sort of work on the C9 number. But let's be honest, I think a lot of this comes down to the drafting phase. You picked a Baron, and you don't have any way, ways or realistic ways of protecting the Baron. Poison Shift basically counters the only way that you're keeping this Baron alive, which is through that heal from Gabe Bizzle. But then you lose the potential, if you're trying to heal the Baron, you lose the potential to apply Gift of Fire through an easy means like Isle of Joseph to the back line like Tyra's. Compositionally, it's very difficult to see C9 to actually work this game, and SK seems to have the number. Exactly what they've got right now. Kraken marching down the lane. At about half HP right now, just getting chunked out by Kavalafar using those on points from range. When those uh, double stacks are obviously Rose Offensive having a uh, stacking up to two times, can use it very, very quick succession. Old School's not had a good game thus far. Iron Cannon as well, just to sway SK, but that's, uh, that's just a, like the Kraken is just just not going down anytime soon. Even Gabe Vizzle with the alternating current is just trying to chomp through it, but the range advantage from SK is pretty apparent right now. Yeah, they can't commit too hard here. I think they'll be happy with two turrets with this Kraken and they're going to back off here. They can't commit to the fight though. It's too difficult to fight in those situations because uh, you, from what you're finding in these, these fights, a lot of these fights are quite extended. You know, you need time to build up those stacks for Black Feather. You're allowing him to just sort of be old school over a m number of seconds. If you do that under a turret, you're never going to find a win. So you have to be very careful about the places that you choose to fight here for SK. You kind of got to draw Cloud9 out into the open so that you have a completely free field for Kavalafar to be super mobile in and find those wins. We're going to have C9 just taking their back camps away. Super careful here with these flares coming down. Know that SK seem to have their number. Old School's now got a metal jacket, by the way. It's not something you see on Barons. I want to really highlight this, right? Old School has got a metal jacket. 
Barons very rarely build any more than a reflex block. This does limit Baron's potential power ceiling. Baron does like to have four weapon power items to really hit the hardest. And with the Metal Jacket, suddenly he's not going to quite have the same effect that he could do if he had four damage items. It makes the pick a little less effective than it would have been if he'd been able to go four full weapon power items. That is crucial to SK because Baron usually provides a timer in terms of a late game powerhouse. Now that powerhouse is more like a power shed. Oh, Old School might be in a little bit of trouble here. In fact, Water is going to get popped. There comes the Gawler, but this time Old School is outside of it, but it's not going to matter. Iron Cannon comes down, hits Tyrus, and now Old School is in the prime position, but Oblivion is actually going to separate his team as I Love Joseph jumps into the Kaku to get away. But SK, they're just going to be able to chase this one up. It's a massive problem here for them. If they lose Joseph at this point, gets flared out as well. Tyrus and Kavalafar are just going to be able to chase him down and finally cut him down. Goes down. Who's it going to go over to? Rose offensive. Oh, nearly. Kaku away. Kaiken over. See you later. There we go. Another kill goes over to, to Kavalafar. 11, 3, and 5. Thanks. This guy is just popping off. So you're seeing old school really struggling to deal the damage necessary. A lot of armor on the side of SK as well. Kavalafar's got his own metal jacket. And this is the problem when you have a Baron that can't commit to four weapon power items. Not quite as scary as you generally tend to see Barons being. And remember, the control from SK in these fights, they've got great zonal control with the, the, the Gauntlet. They've got great zonal control with the Frostburn on the Samuel. And they're actually just controlling the pace and making it so much easier for Kavalafar to get the work done necessary. Everybody on SK right now is basically facilitating Kavalafar. Either making it easier for him to chase his target down, or being a big enough damage threat that it provides a distraction so Kavalafar isn't the main target right now. And Kavalafar also picking up a breaking point. Remember, if he's now surviving longer because Baron isn't doing enough damage, he's also building up breaking point stacks a lot easier. Frostburn allows him also to build breaking point stacks easier because his targets are easier to hit as well. SK have got a great composition here. Comfort picks for them in bounds, and it seems to have paid off in this second game of the series. I mean, you can see the scout trap vision here for SK. Just absolutely, just covering the map. Just making sure they can spot I Love Joseph at every single moment of this game. Yeah. Now, Kraken is going to go over. And I mean, SK, they are looking for the victory here. Cloud9, they're just cramming in this bush, just making sure they can just find a nice engagement. Gabe is all showing himself now, same with old school. But I mean, it all just came down to the draft phase, it seemed. Absolutely. SK could look to force another fight here, but it's C9 oh, doing Gorner it. Gorner does come down, but it's going to come out as well. He's going to get blocked perfectly. Old School again is in the middle of the fight, surviving somehow, but it doesn't matter because there we go. Kavalafar picks up the first kill. He's just got his number. Old School can't do anything. He's going to jump a road offensive straight on Tyler of Joseph, who ends up falling for the double kill. Gabe is all last member alive for Cloud9. He's got an alternating curve, but he's going to go down. Ace for SK and game number two. SK Gaming seal it out. I think compositionally won this game, Draft won this game, played it perfectly as well. They were really struggling against Old School in the early game, but then they hit those item spikes necessary to have the team fights that worked. And again, there just wasn't enough protection or peel for this Baron. And because he was forced to go Metal Jacket, because of how much of a threat Kavanafar was, he never hit the ceiling that Barons can hit. And unfortunately, the damage output just wasn't there. You saw it in these fights. Baron wasn't getting any work done. SK were getting tickled by this C9 composition. They, 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 that was a very messy set of team fights, by the way. They, they knew there wasn't a clean execute. It was just everybody clumped up, everybody hitting everybody. But SK were not receiving enough consistent damage to actually threaten them. And while they were outputting far more. I mean, I want to see what they're going to be able to do in the draft in game number three. One apiece right now, but the analyst says should break that game down a little bit further as, I mean, the Baron just seems not what Old School wanted. All right. Hashtag E-Euphoria, I believe, is the new hashtag <laughs> on the block right now. Not quite yet. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too ahead of myself right here, but we have a game on our hands. Absolutely. The first map, C9 just ran away with it. It looked like this could easily be a 3-0. SK, they've come back into things. Yeah, they definitely did, and that Black Feather with that Arden worked really well for them. And for some reason, the old school dived into a dive comp, and multiple times jetpacks landed some really godly gauntlets, mm -hmm. and old school kind of jumped into it. And I felt like, first of all, atomization was a little off. Gabe went for alternating Kerr instead of in getting an Atlas. Taka or Joseph got an Atlas at the 19:45 uh, uh, minute mark. And I was a little late. And what they want to do is minimize the damage from Black Feather so Baron can scale in fights. But too often than not, Baron was 
immediately killed and they lost every fight after uh, Old School died. Yeah, and right at the start of the series, we said for SK, player to watch was Kvalifar. <laughs> if he needed a stellar <laughs> performance, that is it right there. 13, 3, and 6. 100% kill participation as well. I mean, what do you do if you're Cloud9 right now, knowing that he can do that? Do you have to just ban Blackfeather every game now? I don't think you have to be quite that drastic. I mean, it is still a pick that they should be able to find ways to deal with, but yep. that is one of Kavalfar's bread and butters. The melee laners is what he knows best. It's maybe something that, you know, Cloud9 haven't had to go up against too frequently because we aren't seeing these melee laners that frequently in North America. So, you know, perhaps just that little bit of a learning curve. It, it's just kind of interesting that it felt like, you know, game one, Cloud9 gets like a very prototypical Cloud9 North American comp. And then game two, they sort of just moved away from that. They yeah. went to almost a European style composition with that Baron in the lane. And it just really did not look yeah. like it was an old school hero. It definitely felt like it was... The second game felt more like a European style game for sure. Okay. But let's take a look at a couple of the moments in that fight. Sweet Jay, do you want to run us through this first fight? Yeah, sure. Here's a fight at the 16 minute mark here. And you can see Baron jumping in and kind of diving. And you can see he jumps on the left, focuses a Samuel. Um, they, although they do kill Samuel, Kavalafar is still alive, but he kind of jumps onto Kavalafar for the most part. And I felt like positioning from Baron was really important in this game. You don't have to jump into a team. The, the only time you want to aggressively jump jets into a team is when they're low and they're running away from you. Mm -hmm. You want to use that jump jets to kite and reposition yourself and then do some more damage. And then that's when um, the team then probably will start positioning away from you and then you want to jump jets back into the fight. I don't, I don't think you should start a fight with a jump jets in because first of all, you, don't, you haven't stacked your breaking point. Um, and you put yourself in a bad position if you're jumping into a team that wants to dive onto you. It's almost like he was trying to follow the attacker, right? He was trying to get in with Joseph and help right. out his jungler. But I, I guess it didn't really work out for them in that one. SK looking fantastic, though. And honestly, across the game, it was very back and forth. It's not like this was easily SKs or easily C9s mm -hmm. at all. Like, it definitely could have gone either way. But we're into the draft. Arden being taken away immediately by Cloud9. Yeah, yeah Arden's going to be banned here for sure. SK will probably ban Koshka here because if they ban Lyra, Cloud9 is going to first pick that Koshka. So I feel like they're going to change their draft and just go ahead and ban Koshka right off the map. You can see there's a lot of discussion going on amongst the members of SK, maybe trying to have that debate over do they want to ban the Koshka or the Lyra. They're going to be dipping into their bonus time on their first ban. We often said on the analyst <laughs> test during the regular season that, you know, it's not common to see that, but this tone is one of the few times where it was warranted. And I think the discussion there as well is we can allow the Koshka through if we want and then go for the Grump Jar again, repeat draft one, which, you know, looked good, but they lost game one, right? Yeah. It's like, do you really want to go down that same route again? Both healers going to be picked up though. Yeah, and if, if they want to play Grump Jar, they should ban Glaive here because Glaive is actually pretty decent into Grump Jar, if you guys seen from yesterday's games. So Glaive could potentially be a ban here. Lance is also good into Grump Jaw if they want to run Grump Jaw. But however, Cloud9 won't play Lance with a Lyra uh, captain. So I think Glaive will probably make the most sense here for... Um, oh, they're actually going to take away the Taka. SK is going to take away that Taka. Grump Jaw is still open though, and I feel Cloud9 is going to be their ban back for their Grump Jaw. And I guess yep. since it's not banned, I think SK will pick it up. And you can see heavy, heavy focus against I Love Joseph from these bands, right? Both fa facing against that jungler. They're very obviously nervous about going against Joseph. Also very likely that they may want to grab the Samuel here uh, that they've banned yeah. away the Taka. I'm kind of surprised that they're even taking this long because it, it seems like such an obvious Samuel pick based on how they've been drafting. Yeah. So the Samuel pick here is good. However, Baron is not open because there's no assassins. Blackfeather, Koshka, and Taka are all the best assassins to handle a, a, a Baron. So now they can pick Baron along with like a CP Kestrel and just Glaive. have that range game. Or oh, Glaive too. I mean, Get that's that really Samuel good counter. as well. Um, so Glaive, Baron are up. They can also do Gwen, Glaive what would work really well too if they want. Um, there's a lot of options for Cloud9, but Baron looks really good right now because there's literally no uh, hard counters to him that is available. Yeah, this is this is the tricky thing. I think this is why SK were hesitating on that last pick. They're like, have we drafted ourselves into a hole here? Like, how do we actually deal with a Baron? It's going to be a Fox locked in, though. A Vox, sorry, not Fox. <laughs> <laughs> going to be locked in there. This isn't Smash Bros. And I'm curious to see what they'll follow up with that one. Do we still think it's going to be something along the lines of a Glaive? I would expect it to be because they do need something that can counter the Samuel. They don't have that just yet. 
Uh, just you need a way to keep him out of the drifting dark. They could even go for a Grumpjaw or a Catherine, and just but that would make a very strange composition. But we've seen Cloud9 do yeah. weird things before. We have seen strange things, and these are the teams to bring that kind of thing <laughs> out. But now you've got to bring up the question of. Is Baron a pick available for SK, or is that just not really realistic at this stage? Yeah, I don't think it's that good of a pick because Adagio Captain doesn't give that much peel, as you see from last game for Baron. Um, so that's going to be a tough. And plus, Adagio, uh, Lyra counters Baron pretty hard. Lyra can portal in and put the bulwark up, which disables his escape abilities. Yeah. So Lyra would, would it was really good at Baron. It would be bad for SK to pick it's Baron like, here. Even if you don't have assassins on your team, Lyra almost enables other heroes to become assassins in, in being able to get that gap close. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm I'm just iffy on the sky pick here. Uh, it doesn't really counter the Samuel, other than being able to reposition onto the other side of him, so you don't have your entire team getting hit by Malice and Verdicts. But at the same time, like you, she's not going to force. Samuel out of a drifting dark. Gwen going to be the final pick here. So Kvalifar going away from the melee laners. Yeah, so very different compositions coming out from these two teams. And this is going to be an intriguing game. Uh, Suijay, you're desperate to tell me something right yeah, now. Yeah, I think it makes sense because uh, with Sky picking, that, that disables any weapon power melee. I mean, you play Rona into Sky, you're, you're asking to mm -hmm. lose. So Gwen definitely made a lot of sense there. Um, and Sky is a skill matchup between Samuel and Sky. It's really who's going to be better at outplaying and out mechanicing one another. So Sky and Samuel are pretty equal. However, they do have am... Lyra, stronger captain. We do have to move on. We've got to get on into this game. Who do we think is going to take this one? Oof. I'm going to say Cloud9. Okay, Cloud9. I like Lyra with Vox, so Cloud9. Two for Cloud9. We'll see how the casters are feeling as we pass it over for game three. Thank you very much, guys, over on the desk. And game number three, what a piece right now. SK Gaming versus Cloud9. And I mean, what a disappointing loss there for Cloud9 in that second game. Yeah, we, we talked about it last game. Baron didn't have the peel necessary. You build breaking point, you build three items. You really should be trying to play that range. Building breaking point stacks, making it difficult for Kavalafar to get to you. But uh, old school was just saying, I know, I'm going to jump into Kavalafar and allow him to kill me easily and didn't even have the time to build the breaking point stacks. It was a, they're playing the team fights in a very odd way there for C9. They weren't quite necessarily the right way, right way to approach it. This time around, we've got a different set of compositions though, Jaws. Sky coming out in this Unified Live Championships. Again, like Suijay said, a bit of a skill matchup versus the Samuel. Triple ranged as well. And something that I know that Kavalafar can play is CP Gwen. I would be thoroughly surprised to see a CP Gwen. I don't think it's going to happen. But if you're going to play CP Gwen into anything, triple range is the time to do it. Oh, we could see it. That's, that's the that's kind the of thing. question. You like, could see we it. We could see it. We'll have to wait and see. Well, we'll have to wait and find out. We are on to the fold. Game number three. Cloud9 and SK Gaming, they're very, I wouldn't say kind of evenly matched thus far. I mean, both of the games kind of have been kind of one-sided, right? And the one thing I want to pick up on here as well is the fact that Sky, what, 23% win rate right now? I mean, Kavalafar in a lot of trouble, I think, <laughs> for Barrage. Healing comes out from Jetpacks. In fact, they're just going to keep marching forward here. Kavalafar's a one auto attack away from going down, but Jetpacks is going to get taken very low as well. In fact, I get a double kill. Oh, oh no. no. Disaster for SK at the start. It's going to lose so much of their jungle. Tyrus is going to be forced out. See, I just walk in, take two kills, and now we're going to waltz out with a huge win for them in the early game. SK making a vital mistake. Kavalafar walking, even had a flare to check that brush. He was not expecting an invade from a triple range there. See the replay here. Kavalafar just walking away, and the four barrage just tears him up. Yeah, I mean. It was just an unfortunate mistake there that he uh, walked in without checking, wasn't expecting that early invade from C9. And then right at the end here, this is the sad moment, Gay Bizzle. Oh, the sigil, sigil execute. Oh boy, you don't see it often. Old School taking a lot of damage. SK Gaming trying to trade up a little bit. Drifting Dark does come through. Old School has a back off very, very sharpish. In fact, so does Joseph. Not with that full, with that full barrage up, he can push forward, but with Jetpacks with a sustain and Tyrus as well. They're just going to decide to just uh, back up. I'm, try I'm trying to think think of where these two teams are actually going to find an engage from. You just feel like they're going to try and play at each other from range. And at some point, Gabe Bizzle's going to turn around and say, let's portal into the middle of them and try and blow them up. But they don't have the same level of burst that the SK Gaming team do. And SK Gaming need to get the advantage early on here. They're likely going to have a tension bow Gwen build. And obviously, the uh, spike from the Samuel is a little bit earlier than that of the Sky. So SK Gaming, they'll want to try and get the pressure on early. They'll want to be able to siege up turrets a little bit quicker. They'll want to be able to start to win teamfights a little bit more readily. Old school now the target. Kvalifar going in. Jetpacks also. 
Just trying to put pressure on him in lane because Lyra, unlike her traditional area, is not sitting in lane supporting old school. Actually spending a lot of his time roaming the jungle with I Love Joseph. Yeah, now he's going to join old school. So Joseph's going to have to deal with himself for a little bit, but he's going to rotate also. I mean, it's level three mark for Joseph. Does have two points in the Surrey strike to reposition. With Tyrus, I kind of want to touch on this pick again. I mean, he's going to have to be a really big impact. In fact, by Bulwark goes down, Joseph gets healed up by the Sigil. Old School is going to have to run away as well as Tyrus does join them. A lot of damage from Cavalifar, obviously. We know Gwen, a very, very good early game hero. She's pushing forward once more. Gay okay, Vizzle, though, there with the heals. Yeah, double heals, by the way, but obviously Gay Vizzle more utility because he can get a, a team wide heal in the early game, whereas obviously Jetpack's more single target, very more damage focused as well. It's going to be, I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot of three-man lanes in this game. It's going to be Siege versus Siege, Wave Clear versus Wave Clear. And it'll be a very sort of minute game about who can thread the needle with that forward barrage, who can thread the needle with the Malice and Verdict, pick off the kills, and then eventually be able to take a turret here. It's going to be very close, I think, uh, when you look at how these teams are wanting to approach. Because again, like we said, there's no real way to force an engage from either side. It's basically going to be land skill shots from afar, and then if you get enough damage done, try and find an executing blow and then try and force a three, two versus three. Because at that point, you don't really have anything like a glaive or anything like that to actually force a fight. The only person that can force a fight is Lyra. And that's going to be barreling two squishy ranged heroes into a tension bow potential Gwen build, which is very burst heavy. Well, I mean, this Gwen, speaking about burst, just picked up a tension bow around three minutes and 30 seconds. Not the quickest we've seen. We've seen one at three minutes the other day. It was uh, pretty terrifying to come up against, but this is uh, going to be equally terrifying. If he's already getting shoved underneath his turret here. Poison shift first item actually for old school. So once more, just wanting re to reduce those heals is just his top priority. Yeah, poison shift first here for old school as well. Not the highest damage output, but again, it will allow to facilitate Isle of Joseph to be able to take a singular target out a little bit more effectively. It's a really interesting uh, shaping up in terms of item builds. Remember, obviously Cavalifar now on this tension bow spike is going to be wanting to get up close and personal with that back line from C9. I love Joseph and Old School going to be targets for him, trying to burst them out very quickly. I think once Tyrus gets Frostburn, we will then start to see SK make some moves, trying to then push on with this Malice and Verdict Frostburn, find those big hitting basic attacks with the Gwen, and try and look for a siege on the back of that. I mean, you could just really blow someone up with that tension bow proc. I mean, obviously utilizing her passes as well, as well as the buckshot. Slow everybody up. Tyrus pushes in there with the frost burn. And you found your what? Well, you found at least one pick off, hopefully, on Old School or Joseph. I mean, Gabe Fizzle, he's going to be obviously building towards the fountain here. Picked it up a couple of minutes ago. But the thing is that I want to see here is um, Jetpacks. Is he going to go for his alternating current build like he did in the previous game? Or is he going to kind of stick to more of a traditional build? Yeah, no, Jetpack's probably not going to take lessons from Gabe Vizzle, I think, with the alternating current. But I think he's uh, he's more likely to build a bit more traditionally. You definitely want to consider a Crucible here, because obviously Death from Above can be devastating. If Skyland's a good Death from Above, that's prime opportunity for Old School to jump in and try and get work done. Not yet got the frost burn, but it looks like SK are fighting. A skirmishing going on. Gabe Vizzle's going to have to use the boost to get away. Tyra's already just forcing through. Does have a believe in available to him. Old School taking a lot of damage from those mounts and verdicts. Even Gabe Vizzle having to back off and use that Sigil for healing. Cavalifar as well, just pressuring that lane, just making sure those minions reach that turret. Good hold on the uh, fountain, by the way, for Gabe Bizzle. Didn't pull the panic button just yet. And that means they'll have that opportunity there if they need it. Again, still holding on to oh. it. Gabe Bizzle, there's the fountain. There we go. Death from above comes down to separate SK, just to make sure they have to back off at that point. And there you go. That is going to be the fountain burp for Cloud9. So SK now kind of got free reign over this turret. It is the big three-man lanes we were expecting. This is all about Siege right now for both of these compositions. You want to get that first turret of the game. You want to be able to win that poke war. And SK win that early on. It's a lot easier to get consistent poke down with a Samuel than it is with a Sky. Sky can't alter the area that she's trying to fire at with her forward barrage. She has to pick her vector very carefully. Sky, uh, Tyra's on the other hand, he can slam those out left, right, and center, try and hit people down. Obviously, he could be going a Shatterglass as well. There is the option for a Frostburn. Shatterglass would be good against the double squishy in the back line. Frostburn, obviously good to facilitate Cavalifar to get those big tension bro procs. He has gotten the Frostburn. Okay, so he's going to be slowing a lot of people up now. And this is kind of what they want. They want to be able to just push forward and make sure oh. they can just slowly wait, move. Wait a second, George. We've got a level 6 infusion and an infusion in Tyrus' inventory. Well, this is telling me that they want to play on these big power spikes that they've got right now. They want to get the advantage right here and then run with it. 
exactly what they're doing now. Again, gave this all just healing Cloud9 up, but this is going to be the massive problem. But the problem is, can you heal Kvalifar? Buckshot does a live pass away. She's going to get followed through. They're going to jump straight onto Kvalifar. He's in a lot of trouble. Wait for it. Comes out from Joseph. Oh, school, but it just completely misses. One one straight thus far. Jetpacks dodges the Oblivion, but it actually does land onto Gabe Vizzle. Tyrus pushing forward. The Malice and Vernix cannot find the kill onto Joseph just yet. And Cloud9 and SK Gaming just. What a piece at the moment. Kavalafar and Old School falling. Both the carries going down. Probably won't result in a turret just soon. Here we go. Tyra's trying to push on further. He's trying to get out of Joseph. He knows he can do it. Joseph in a lot of trouble here. Same with Gabe Vizzle. Hasn't got too much energy, though, in his pool. So we'll have to back off. But that turret's taken such a beating. That was the engage I was talking about from Gabe Vizzle. You commit everybody to dealing with Kavalafar, but the burst isn't there yet for C9. You don't have the ability to jump in and within the first two seconds deal a significant portion of damage to the enemy that you're trying to focus. Old School has just got a poison shift. Yes, he's working towards a Sorrow Blade right now, but the poison shift was all that he had in terms of a completed tier 3 item. Not exactly the same burst as an almost Sorrow Blade and Tension Bow on the Gwen side, but once I Love Joseph came through, they got a little bit more to deal with the uh, Kavalafar there but unfortunately they traded one for one at the end. That's a trade that I think C9 will be happy to take, given that you've just seen SK invest 500 gold on both of their carries into super early infusions to try and get that advantage, and no advantage was gained. Right now, this is wasted 500 gold because they haven't really done much with it. Hey, Vizzle, though, is going to get a crest on here for Barrage just to dissuade SK, but the Drifting Dark's going to come through. Grusebolt is going to block... Nothing all too much, at least I didn't see it. Wafer actually does come out from old school as well, just to make sure everybody gets silenced. It's actually a pretty significant block on the uh, Aces High. So that Aces High was actually aimed for I Love Joseph, and the Crucible, I think, unless it was actually I Love Joseph's reflex block, did the work. Oh, a passageway through, though. They spotted Kavanafar on the side and just erase him. Joseph comes through, takes the ball back. Old School's going to find Jetpacks. He's going to be able to run him down without too much of an issue. For Barrage onto Tyrus. Drifting Dark as well is going to heal him up. Joseph in a lot of trouble. Just ends up getting taken down from Old School, though. Cloud9 with the ace. Suddenly, they find a weakness and they dive in. They deal with Kavanafar straight away. He was kind of out of position, a little bit isolated. And unfortunately, Tyrus and Jetpacks couldn't do much because minions were blocking those big, Hard-hitting Malice and Verdicts, and now C9 come away with the first turret of the game, and now the Poison Shift comes into effect. Samuel, drifting dark procced, he was suddenly about to pop off with some sustain. Old School jumps in, lands that mortal wound, and says, nah, -uh, no way. Denying a lot of that healing is pretty much won that fight. I mean, Sorrowblade even picked up here for Old School now, so he has got a lot of bang for his buck. With all that gold he picked up on those couple of kills, sure, he's going to spend on something nice. Avizel now just uh, trying to push forward in this lane now. And like you said, the three-man lanes at this current moment in time. And with Aces High available to Kavalafar as well as the Infusion, I mean, they're going to want to look for another fight. It invested in another Infusion, that's the really important point. Another 500 gold for Kavalafar, really saying, I have to win from this item spike. Gave Vizzle the target, he has got the portal available. Won't be forced to use it, we'll just get out of there using the Sigil healing and that uh, the movement speed that it provides them, and now C9 again on the defensive. Yeah, but SK, they've got a lot of poke potential with Kavalafar and Taurus. Another passageway through, straight into a bright ball. There comes the Oblivion. He's going to get blocked. Aces High went a little bit wide as well. Joseph just hiding back. Now Fountain's going to get blocked from SK to keep them all nice and healthy. And Sigil as well is going to heal up the rest of Cloud9. It will be just a kind of dissuaded fight, but the thing is, look at the damage on that turret, Scoundrel. SK, they're so close to taking it. Yeah, but they are quickly getting out of the portion of the game where their composition is strong. Kavalafar obviously investing so heavily into the infusions. Look how far he is now behind in terms of uh, items for in comparison with old school. Old school now at coat of plates and a heavy steel on top. And Kavalafar right now only on that tension bow, which is one of the cheapest weapon power items in the game. And just a sorrow blade and that light armor there too. They are really far behind in terms of their builds moving forwards because they know how important it was to be able to capitalize early and they haven't been able to do so. I think difficult spot for SK. You want to abuse the fact that Gwen has got huge punch power in the early game, but they haven't been able to and actually C9 have correctly identified if they dive in with the engage of the Lyra portal, which is the only solid engage this entire game has, 
and then you put pressure on Kavalafar, suddenly the one key to the early game is gone for SK. Well, Death and Bruv does come down. Another passageway followed through with the Pride Ball one. But yeah, look at Joseph's on the sidelines here. First comes down, it's going to get blocked. Oblivion as well to follow up, but Cloud9 can't really find anything just yet. Wait for it to silence through members. That's going to be big. Kavalafar's going so low, and you can see Cloud9, their health bars are still so high. They're going to jump onto Tyrus. They're going to be able to find the kill. Old School just going mad at this point. He finds jetpacks. Kavalafar on an inch of HP, 12 to be precise. Make that zero as he goes down by the sigil. Ace for Cloud9 once more, and they're going to take another turret. Kavalafar, Ace's highs have been missing all game, but even if they weren't, Gabe Bizzle has had this locked up, sewn up, and crucible down to a T. It's been a perfect demonstration of mechanical team fighting from C9. They've identified the one strength of the SK composition from the early game, and they've been able to shut it down every time. Lyra jumps in, limits the mobility of Kavalafar with that bright bulwark, and then allows I Love Joseph and Old School to dive in and deal with him. Once he's down, Tyrus is not so good in a close quarters engage on this Samuel. Samuel not meant to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a melee range. He's supposed to be a long-range hero who can kite effectively. Not happening right now. Well, for kiting is just exactly what he isn't doing right now. Jumps in, death from up, stuns one up, but already Kavalafar's just taking care of Oblivion. He's gonna find Gay Fizzle, but it's not gonna matter because another race comes through for Cloud9. How is this happening, SK? They just cannot find the re-engages. No, it's, a, it's not even about the re-engages. It's the fact that Tyra's, you know, this is supposed to be a kiting hero. He walks right into the middle, but even when he literally face-checks Cloud9, they ignore him because they know that he is not a significant damage threat. They deal directly with Kavalafar, and then Tyra's becomes an afterthought. They've, and they've correctly identified the only real threat in a full-on team fight where you aren't given the chance to poke beforehand, and that is the Kavala fight. And I think, I think C9 have played this incredibly well. Uh, SK, I think they had the right idea. They were obviously looking to be aggressive in the early game, but C9 had great wave clear. Obviously, I love Joseph, spent a lot of time in lane. We did expect a lot of three-man lanes in this particular game. And I think C9 have just played that defensive strategy a bit better. Well, there we go. Another passageway gets followed through by Bulwark. There's the first of judgment. It lands. It lands onto two. But Tyrus correctly identified as the kill, apparently, and leaving Kavalafar this time instead. Double kill for old school as he just sonic zooms forward without a care in the world. Sentry's going to go down. And Cloud9, they are going to take game number three off SK. An average of two aces per match for Cloud9 so far. They have been dominant when given the opportunity to. SK off that, especially off that Black Feather, that seems to be a real key ban for the C9 squad. Once that's down, Kavalafa has not had the same level of performances that we have come to expect from him. 0-6-2 on this Gwen. Really shut down in the early game. When you shut down a Gwen in the early game, you don't give her the opportunity to snowball from a tension bow. You've almost cut half her power level. Not as half as strong as a pick if you don't get the opportunity to pressure off the back of that, but got to sort of wind back all the way to the start of this game, sort of around six, seven minutes. Early infusion investment and then a double infusion investment on Kavalafar. That's 1,000 gold from just Kavalafar that he invested into infusions at the six or seven minute mark. And obviously hoping to team fight, but the, with the lack of the engage, how can you force a team fight with your infusions? You can't. That's the one real issue for SK. You can't make use of them because you can't force anything and Cloud9 just sit back and say, well, we'll just wait for them to time out then, shall we? And they did. Well, the overarching question is, can EU build NA in a best of five? I mean, looking right now, two to one to Cloud9, but over on the desk, Elbowie Munch and the rest of the guys to break that game down a little bit further. You're absolutely right, Jaws. Europe are against the ropes, and immediately you've got to start the conversation by bringing up that sky pick from yeah. Joseph. That was detrimental in those team fights. Yeah, I thought it was a brilliant draft by Cloud9 there. Joseph played Sky so well, but it kind of only counters any melee uh, uh, weapon carries that Cloud may have wanted to pick, so that he had to pick Gwen. But Adagio Captain is not good into a sky because there's mm -hmm. no front line. And you can see his four barrages were expertly positioned, and he just went in there and blew every, anyone up that basically ate the four barrage, and none of them built defense against the Sky. Yeah. So Sky versus Samu is really a skill matchup, and Joseph showed that he's a better jungler in that game for sure. Yeah, able to just kind of sit around the edge of the team fights as well, just constantly layering out that damage. And we saw the early game was all about the siege, as Excoundrel said on the cast, but SK just couldn't seem to finish anything off. Yeah, they came so close to taking the turn. They had it so low, but... It took them a long time to get at that low, and they weren't able to then, you know, like I said, push in 
and finish that off, get that objective gold, and the investments in the infusions. I think Excalibur made a, a fantastic point there. That is a lot of gold to be spending yeah. that at that stage of the game and then have it really just not pay off whatsoever. All right, so now a big question for me is, do we think that last game was just Cloud9 having a little bit of a slip up and now it's smooth sailing from here? Yeah, I think they may have messed around with the weird itemization, like Gabe getting Ultimate Colonel and Captain Adagio. Mm -hmm. And I think game three, they definitely played, a, I, I felt like a lot more focused and serious. Itemization mm -hmm. was perfect. Gabe had perfect act active in terms of his fountains and his crucibles. So I think uh, heading into game four, they probably want to see what a see what a series and, and take it away. Yeah, I think maybe it was a little bit of getting very confident after yeah. game one because they looked so dominant and maybe a little too confident. Having to reel it back <laughs> and in just a just little bit. Reeling it back in, playing a little bit more standard and again, looking extremely strong. I think uh, this next game is going to be very, uh, very much show where exactly these two teams stand. Yeah, definitely a big one in terms of where EU and NA stand as well. We do have a replay from that game as well, just to go a little bit deeper on into. Yeah, in this play, you can watch the Sky poking the damage and watch how he positions and, and who he tends to focus on and, and, uh, Broad and look at that, the damage. And Adagio, again, can't front line, is so low already. And Joseph's just constantly moving around with the Surrey Strike and then getting great four barrages. And the look how low SK is at this point. They definitely the fight is lost. Um, and if you can't kill one member of a team with a liar composition, then you're probably going to lose that fight right away. And beautiful <laughs> Heads up sigil. sigil by Gabe. And that wasn't the first time he did it in that game either. He dropped that sigil onto an opponent for a kill multiple times. Just very great awareness yeah. of the situation and knowing that he can find the kill even as a cap. And also just Lyra in general was hugely impactful in that game. So many times we saw a fight kind of going even and then Cloud9 will back away, heal up a little bit and then go back in to continue. But we're into the draft. Arden and Koshka both banned away once again and Lyra this time picked up by SK. Now this is a pick that SK has played a lot in the regular season. It uh, was actually their most played hero but they only had about a 44% win rate, winning eight of their 18 games with the Lyra. So they really like the pick, but maybe not necessarily having the level of performance that mm -hmm. they feel like they have with it. Yeah, so we've got both healers locked in once again. This time it's mirrored around there. Where do you think SK have to go with this battle? Yeah, probably Sky. I would say either Sky or Glaive. I think Sky makes sense if they want to run a, a, a melee Laner, weapon power on Kavalafar with Lauer is actually very strong because Lauer needs a tanky in front line like Rona, etc. So Sky would make a lot of sense and definitely uh, Joseph Sky, you know, after game three, I don't think they want to face that again. So let's see what SK is going to decide to do here. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one and you can see that as they are using up a lot of their bonus time here. They don't want to rush into anything stupid. Obviously, Black Feather Band. It's going to be the Taka Band again. So, same bands out of SK as what we saw in game one. Yeah, oh, game two, I sorry. I don't know about the Taka Band because they beat Taka when Joseph was on Taka. And Taka is not really that good into Lyra. He's bursty, but Lyra can just pop the Sigil and heal up the person that Taka's focusing. I'm wondering if Cloud9 takes Samuel here. It's, oh, they're going to go for the Glaive. Okay, so I, the reason I was curious about that is. Samuel, while obviously we know SK has a very strong Samuel, they really like Samuel. There were only three teams in all of Inglory 8 that had a winning record with Samuel. SK was one of them, Cloud9 was one of them. So these are two of yes. the best Samuel teams. <laughs> I wouldn't have been surprised to say, oh, you banned the Taka? Yeah. We're going to take that pick now. But And they're probably going to take Samuel here and Gwen, Rana mm -hmm. with Gwen, or maybe even a weapon follower or laner like Rona. So Samuel looks good here. I wouldn't stray away from it. Um, because Samuel with yeah. Lyra is actually very strong. Samuel is a very high sustain hero. So early game, him with Lyra gives him a huge buff uh, in early game. And I'm oh, actually going to go with Arona here. So yep. changing things up a little bit. We saw quite a bit of this in lane yesterday. The Kavalafar special. Everyone that, pretty much anyone that played Rona in lane at this point, is their inspiration for it most likely came from Kavalafar. He played it so many times during the regular season. I believe it was uh, nine games during regular season that Kavalafar played that hero. And there's the Samuel. This is like the quintessential SK right. composition. Yeah, as predicted, and I think Sky is good here. Uh, they can do a Captain Adagio weapon power that Glaive and then go with Sky because Sky counters Rona so hard. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other pick that would work unless 
um, they want to try like Vox with a with a CP Glaive, but that's that's really risky because Lyra can heal whoever Glaive bursts down. So let's see what Cloud9 is going to decide here. So one Ooh. of them Ooh. actually going to go with a Fortress on that one to round out the composition. Just very quickly on the SK composition, the biggest issue Excoundrel was pointing out last game was lack of engage. Does the Rona kind of shore up that weakness? Yeah, Rona is good. She can jump into the fray. She has two gap closers. It's into the fray and her full splitter, so it works really well. She's, she's tanky, so it's going to work really well for Samuel to have that front line. Okay. I like that Fortress pickup. It's a not a common pick for Cloud9, but they were undefeated with it in the regular season. All right, we'll see if they can maintain that record. Gentlemen, quickly, before we get on into this game, who do we think is going to take it? I'm sticking to my guns, Cloud9. Cloud9. Cloud9, the Fortress Mortar Wound against the Rona Lifesteal, it's going to work really well. Okay, Cloud9 across the desk once again. We'll see if the casters agree as we pass it over for the fourth game in this series. Game number four, SK. They are against the ropes and Cloud9 taking those games, two of them at least. And I just can't believe it's come down to this. Can SK be the first team to take a best of five off NA? It's not looking like it thus far, but Kvalifar, we've seen him on the Rona before and he's picked it up again. Well, you know, when the, all the guns are out, you have to bring out the rocket launcher and Kvalifar has picked up that Rona in the lane. It's something that he's famous for in the European scene. SK need to win this game to force it to a best of one. For the pride of Europe, the team that every North American team said, we respect SK, their drafts are interesting, we're not quite sure how to deal with them. They could potentially be the strongest team in this region. And they are currently 2-1 down to Cloud9, who have just played a mechanical blinder in this series. Gabe Vizzle especially, I think Sweejay made a great point. This guy has been items at the correct time, pinpoint precision, engages have been perfect, the shot calling as well from Cloud9 has to be praised because in that last game, they pull the trigger on the Gwen and they take her out. George, let's get onto the Halcyon Vol. This is a big game for Cloud9. Massive game. They're one game away to keeping that record for NA. And that's the overarching question right now. Can SK do it? I mean, we speak about it before, but Tyra's rookie player, first live event. Are the nerves getting to him? I don't think so. I think just Cloud9 right now out mechanicking SK. Already a small oh engage, actually. Whoa, well, reposition from Joseph. Tyra's in a lot of trouble. This could be first blood already. Joseph takes that one off the board. Jetpacks and Kvalifar now are just running away. Joseph, Jetpacks going fairly low. Here's Sigil to heal him up. It's not enough because Old School is going to finish it off with a basic attack. Kvalifar now using the leftover Sigil for HP, but Cloud9. They were already off to a good start. No mercy for Cloud9 already runs straight into that SK composition. Huge, powerful uh, engage from Gabe Bizzle and Old School, obviously, with that Gift of Fire. Splash damage, doing so much work. SK, and actually, that reminded me almost of a StarCraft moment. It was complete rotation of the unhealthy targets from C9 to the back line, making it very difficult for Kvalifar to focus a target and rotating your healthy players to the front line. And it made it so difficult for SK to get work done there. Tyra's was a perfect target to pick off, and I Love Joseph pulled the trigger instantaneously. We haven't even talked about the fact that old school, probably the, one of the best lane adagios in the world, has got his lane adagio. He might be schooling Kavalafar after his performance in that first game. Maybe he needs to take up a couple of lessons in uh, laning. We'll have to wait and see. I want to see old school like just perform this game already. We've seen him throughout this series picking up the Poison Shiv first item on Vox and still managing to do work with it. And this time round, C9 have got a go trigger from the afterburn on I Love Joseph. They can keep up pressure consistently. They can continuously put aggression onto SK, stop Tyrus from hitting his power spikes, put pressure on this Samuel. And it looks like SK are going to have to rotate as a three here because of the threat of the potential invade from C9, the threat of their aggression early on. Kvalifar as well has to be careful because obviously the mortal wounds from that fortress will shut down his survivability and longevity in these team fights. And it'll make it a lot easier for old school to get the work done necessary to deal with Kvalifa. I mean, the all-in engage from Joseph is something we've seen him time and time again. Very aggressive player and uh, can really just live up to uh, live up to the name. Old school taking a fair bit of damage there. Gabe Vizzle as well is going to have to back off on the fortress. I mean, the good thing SK have hit right here, right now, is the ability to sustain. They haven't got the fortress ultimate just yet. There's no poison shiv, obviously. They're probably not going to build it on old school thus far, but I mean, that's going to be the massive problem for them in the early game, just surviving. But after that, I mean, 
the all-in engage from Joseph, mixed with Gay Invisible's attack of the pack. Old School's just going to have a free time first hitting. Yeah, absolutely. Old School working towards that alternating current as well. Big power spike for the Adagio in lane. I love Joseph as well playing the Weapon Power Glaive. And the differences between Weapon Power Glaive and CP Glaive is that obviously he has a lot more early presence in the early game. So obviously he can now then be aggressive, more aggressive than he could have been if he was playing the CP Glaive. And that allows him to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Samuel more effectively. CP Glaive isn't as good against Samuel unless he's complemented by someone else. Weapon Power Glaive can do a lot of the work in his own right. Well, he has found himself in SK's jungle, but SK are there to meet him. Kavalafar is going to be there. Bright Ball won't just lock him up. Afterburn away this time. Kavalafar leaps over the wall using that uh, into way. the fray, Pre using it completely the wrong way. Predicted the wrong way that I Love Joseph was going to try and find an afterburn. It was a good move, but not quite there. That is the healing camp secured by Kavalafar, actually, so they might look for an engage here, Jaws. Yeah, into the fray is available for Kavalafar. Joseph going fairly low. Vanson Verdict doing a fair bit of damage from Tyrus into the fray onto the bush there. Uh, I love Joseph will after burn away, but they're still chasing this one. And Cloud9 will be able to get away, popping those boots, just making sure nice and safely. Uh, a bit of an interesting build there from old school. <laughs> He's got the, did he? Two feet, two boots. Two feet, two boots. Yep. That's about it. I think, uh, did you, if you buy a second tier one boots, I think it might reset the cooldown of the sprint. Because I know when you upgrade your boots, it resets the cooldown of the sprint. Maybe old school thought that he was necessary for him to be able to escape that situation. Well. <laughs> two feet, two boots. That's all I got Because to they say share about the that. same cooldown, right? But if you okay. buy another one, I think it refreshes the cooldown. So I think he was just saying, I, I, maybe I can invest 300 gold not to die here. Oh, so, I mean, buying those boots on the fly, meaning obviously he does reset the cooldown, making sure he can get away. Bit of an expensive uh, method of ex exit. Was was the jungle shop even open when that. I, I, I can't remember. That was just. Maybe, I'm not sure if it was <laughs> a mistake here now. or if there was actually some sort of thought behind it. The only reason I think you would buy two tier one boots is maybe to try and reset the cooldown, but. I'm not even sure if Jungle Shop was open at that point. Well, it's been a, a minute since Jungle Shop was open, so po quite possibly. But Cloud9 still putting on the pressure now, and uh, they do have that range advantage in the lane. That's uh, something else to kind of keep in mind, Old School versus Kavalafar. But Kavalafar kind of used to that. We've seen him time and time again on this Rona pick, and uh, he always does well with it in EU, but bringing it to NA could be a different story. Bring it to an NA team, I oh. should say. Beautiful bright ball watch to stop the afterburn. Doesn't mean he's going to not reposition Tyrus. Tyrus in a lot yeah. of trouble here, actually, just goes down regardless. Serpent Sparse mid fight actually picked up for Kavalafar, trying to get the sustain through. Jetpack's in a 1v3 situation. Kavalafar out of the fight. Joseph's going to be able to chase him down, and Cloud9 find yet another kill. Yeah, unfortunately, just <laughs> Jetpack's trying to juke between the brushes. <laughs> just because you've blocked the afterburn doesn't mean you haven't blocked the stun portion. You only block the movement from the glaive with that bright ball work, and unfortunately, Tyrus wasn't quite respectful enough of that. He's going to move back in here. Kavalafar, like you said, has got that Serpent's Mask. Here we go. Oh, into the fray. Straight on to Joseph. No sustain from him. Tyrus is going to be able to push forward here, but Fire is actually going to kill Kavalafar on the backside. So actually, that's a one-for-one -one trade as old school is just going to gift a kill over to himself. Have they done enough to protect the turret, though? Because if they have protected the turret, that is completely worth. It looks like they have. So it's a one-for-one, -one, but SK keep their first turret of the game, which keeps that gold manageable between the two teams. That is the most important point from that fight. Remember, global objectives are worth so much more in this game than just the odd few kills here and there. That's why you see a lot of teams so heavily focused on trying to get them early on, because it gives you a massive team-wide global gold boon, which helps you then snowball from that position. What I'm really excited to see is the fact that SK, they have been able to take a game of Cloud9, and quite convincingly so as well. They went on a boot camp before coming here, so that give them, you know, the extra experience being in the same house together, you know, not only chilling out, but practicing. Another engagement does come out. In fact, Attack of the Pack is going to get popped. Right, Bulwark is actually going to stop another after it, but I love Joseph still in the front line, taking a lot of damage, but massive oblivion did come through from Tyra's, just sleeping up two members of Cloud9. And if you needed any illustration as to how powerful Mortal Wounds is against Rona, right there was the situation that it was to come to light. Kabbalah are absolutely decimated in that fight. Here we go. They're going to go for another fight. Jetpacks actually just walks into his own death. Kavanafar gets repositioned from the afterburn, but he possibly could have gone down there. Old School still kiting back. Madison Burke from Tyrus. They're going to jump straight back onto it, but little energy from the side of Gabe Vizzle and Isle of Joseph just means they cannot follow that up with more kills. SK just aren't tanky enough right now to do the pull the moves that they are trying to. Kavanafar with very little defense means he's relying solely on the Serpent's Mask and the fortified health from his ultimate to keep him alive, and that is just not enough right now. You're seeing he's very 
very, very reluctant to commit heavily. He's going to commit here, though. Ah, oh, Rev missed onto two people. Joseph's just melting off to burn away. He's going to jump into the fray. That cuts the ultimate versus Judgment. Hits Tyrus. Doesn't get the stun. Only a little bit of damage. Does make sure SK are going to have to back off, though. Are just going to triple recall underneath their own turret. That will mean SK, they have got a lot of free time on this turret now. And yeah, they should be able to get this one here as a one for one. That's a really good return here for SK. Despite the kill lead, this will keep them fairly level on gold. Let's take a look at the, some item spikes being hit left, right, and center. Sorrow Blade for Isla. Joseph picks up a uh, reflex block as well. Tyrus has got his frost burn, like we said, working towards his next tier three attempt, which is likely to be an Eve of Harvest. But C9, smell blood. Here comes oh, the ultimate. attack of the pack, the smell blood. They do, and then here comes the Prime Warrior to snare them all up. Red Mist into them all three of them, but it's not going to matter because the healing wasn't there. He ends up going down. Tyrus gets repositioned with the afterburn passageway to safety for jetpacks. That means Cloud Nine's just going to follow you, buddy. They're just going to jump straight on him. Crystal Sentry completely ignored, and that will be Cloud Nine with another ace. First of this game as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but two, two per series, right? This yeah. is the, the first one they managed to pull off cleanly. And that will give them the pressure on this turret here. Kamalafar's coming back now. Fountain not there, but I mean, you've got to look at how effective these mortal wounds are against Rona. They are devastating. Kavalafar is just not surviving as long as a Rona should do. He's actually working towards a breaking point before itemizing towards defense. Do you know why I like that? Obviously, there is that prep that sort of thought that he should be getting defense at this point but he's not surviving long enough he's not dealing anywhere near as much damage if he's not surviving long enough what's the best thing he can do buff the current lifesteal that he has oh, let's have a look at this replay by the way you see that mortal wound just dead rona shouldn't be going down that quickly she should be able to survive a lot longer than those sort of team tights so you know, once he picks up more damage, he'll actually be hitting harder in the small amount of time that he's staying alive, which is better than trying to deal a little bit of damage, but unfortunately not surviving very long either. So it's better for him to go direct damage at this point, I think, to get a high impact engage and then survive as long as he can with the lifesteal and the healing from uh, jetpacks, rather than have to invest into defense and just really be a bit of a wet blanket in these team fights. I mean, the key word you said there, I think, would be the engage, right? They've never been able to kind of get the engage on Cloud9. Cloud9 have always been engaging on them and one of the things we saw the Lara do last game, passageway, bright bulwark to like slow and you know make sure everybody's kind of snared up. I love Joseph gets completely diminished from it. There's another attack of the pack getting popped. Just making sure they can actually secure this turret. Actually, Tyra's actually popping an infusion there. Bright Ward does come down with the passageway. Isle of Joseph repositioning with the afterburn there. Jetpack goes one, two, three through the passageway again. There's another Oblivion actually just missing. Ron is just spinning around and around and around. Finally finding the kill on Isle of Joseph. The Red Mist actually doing work there as the mortal wounds just weren't apparent. SK now going to try and go for the gold mine, although Jetpack's is smelt. Some potential opportunity here. Ultimate's going to get the regen. I don't think C9 are out of this just yet. There is that gold mine to contend with. They have done this kind of turnaround before. Okay, Buzzle's going to step up. Oh, he's going to step up, and it's just wrong time completely. Another red miss just tears through old school. But they're going to be able to trade that back. If the fire points the kill, Tyrus no is going to go down as well. How are Cloud9 doing this? 2v3 situation. They take it with ease. Jetpacks oh. is going to get jumped on as well. The healing comes through from old school onto Gabe Vizzle. Ends up falling with the alternating current damage. There's the number two. The ace comes through for Cloud9. Already beating their average with the second ace so early into this game. SK found a fight necessary for, the, for them. They were able to clear out those wolves. Then Tyra's got into a good position to start slamming down with the Malice and Verdicts. But then they overcommitted. They started the gold mine. They broke off and tried to force the engage, which unfortunately was then allowing C9 to regen a little bit. They got that regen camp and they came back in. And then they committed to where the Crystal Miner was as well. SK just picking all the wrong areas to fight. And it hasn't worked out for them at all. Old school just devastating them with the damage output that he has right now. Just, I mean, he's got the infusion in his inventory. Well, he did have the infusion. He used it last fight. I mean, just the amount of damage he's outputting. Still got two tier two boosts, by the way. But another engaged attack. The pack comes through. And once more, that bright ball are not doing all too much. Torres has to exit the fight. Passage way through as well. It's just going to segregate Cloud9. That's going to be a triple block on the Oblivion. Adversity Judgment comes down as well. Three members here from oh, SK. But, but the Red Mist is going to go through. Kavalafar's done it. He's finally found the fight in SK. They find the ace. How in SK do you? That's exactly the way they wanted to play it. Forget trying to engage with the Rona. Let Cloud9 come to you. Use the Drifting Dark. Use the Frostburn. Force them to walk directly into your huge Malice and Verdict hits from Tyra's. That's the better way to approach the fights for SK. 
Look at Cloud9's composition. What are they going to do? They're going to run at you. Look at this. They start to kite backwards. Tyra is wailing on them with those Malice and Verdicts. That was a massive Oblivion. Yes, it got blocked, but the damage came down. And actually, I think Cloud9 did SK Gaming a favor by channeling that verse of Judgment because suddenly Old School was no longer dealing consistent damage with his basic attacks. That was a two-second window where Kavalafar got a clean red mist off and there was very little damage output, even with the mortal wounds there to take him down. That was, I think, a small mistake from old school in that fight because it gave Kavalafar the necessary time to deal the damage, to deal that with that backline from C9. But, you know, C9's competition has got one go button, Jaws. Allow them to come to you like this. Well, they're gonna hit that go button right now. Another afterburn straight onto Tyrus, but Red Mist is just churning through Cloud9. They're just gonna disengage for the moment. Old School doing that continuous basic attack damage. Oblivion's gonna come out, separate them now. This is SK's time to kind of re-engage. No, oh, no, is gonna be able to pick up a kill. Old School actually secures it, and Kavalafar's gonna go down. That's the majority of their damage just completely gone. Old School chases up for the double kill. Jetpack's on 22 HP, ends up falling too, and actually Gift of Fire finds the kill. So that's actually a triple kill, the third ace, and Cloud9, they're just pushing for the win now. Uh, Cloud9 found a great fight there. I think SK had the right idea, though, that Cloud9 were walking directly into a channel where Malice and Verdict was so easy to hit. I think that's exactly what Tyra's wants in these fights. But then Kavalafar and low HP, it was almost like a slow motion movie. He ran at them, taking like about 50, imagine like running and taking like 50,000 bullets, and then he jumped a little bit too late. He was wait, he was kind of too hankering on that cooldown to try and get back in there and use the red mist. They were being far better playing around Tyra's and then allowing Kavalafar to find the re-engage when absolutely necessary. I think SK are too, too focused on trying to get Kavalafar into the fray to do a big, big red mist rather than play around the fact that they can kite quite readily with this Tyra's Frostburn build and then allow Kavalafar to jump in when they've already done the damage necessary to make it an easier time for Kavalafar to have, um, you know, a cleanup duty, essentially. Well, you put it perfectly a bit earlier with the Malice and Verdicts. I mean, coming through Drifting Dark in a small corridor, so much damage is going to get applied. And in fact, Passageway is going to get followed through. Attack of the pack as well from Gabe Fizzle. They're just focusing Kavalafar now, but he's got the healing. It's got that's what matters. Oblivion comes through. It's going to get blocked. Tyrus is going to be the first casualty of the fight. They're going to solo out Jetpacks, nice. and now it's Kavalafar in a 1v3. Ultra is going to get jumped up with Into the Fray and Red Mist. He's going to get repositioned with Afterburn, but I think that's Cloud9 with another race, and Kraken spawns the second the fight's over. It's the wrong idea. Like Cloud9, if, if you're not forcing Cloud9 to make the engage, like you're doing their job for them. SK, by running into the Cloud9 composition, they're delivering Samuel directly to Cloud9 without even forcing Cloud9 to use an afterburn or a fortress ultimate to make that happen. They are gifting Cloud9 these engages. Take a step back. Cloud9's composition, what does it do? The, the fortress can only engage. Yes. Uh, um, a, a glaive can peel, but it's a weapon power glaive. It's not a cooldown glaive. You can literally get one or two afterburns off per fight, and that's about it. This is an engage composition from Cloud9. Why do that job for them? Why give them the engage? Use your kiting with the Frostburn on this Samuel and then allow them to come to you. That gives you the best opportunity of getting the damage down necessary to turn the fight around. But SK don't quite get that. They think they need to, they think they need to like, barrel in onto old school and kill him, but they don't really have the composition to do that. Don't really have the huge amount of burst damage from the Rona. She's a sustained damage fighter, and she can't sustain very well against the Mortal Wounds Jaws. There we go. SK's kind of last stand here. They're going to jump in. Kavalafar on the back line. They're nice block. Tyra's actually on the Artiman. Red Mist onto Old School. He's going to enter the frame as well. He's going to jump straight on top of it, but it's not going to matter. Mortal Wounds. Oblivion as well. He's going to get blocked. And now will be Kavalafar falling once more. C9. They're just going to push for the win here. Tyrus is going to end up going down. And that is going to be it. The history books are just going to continue to be NA taking out EU in best of fives. Game number three goes over to Cloud9. What an absolute amazing series played by them. Now, he talked about the engages from SK. I feel like they needed to make that engage because Kraken was there. So they couldn't just let C9 dance around with the Kraken and then take the turrets. It was a last ditch attempt from SK, but C9, their kiting was on point. Again, Gabe Vizzle's itemization was fantastic and use of itemization was fantastic. It was an excellent, excellent performance from C9. It was clinical. I don't think we expected anything different from a team that even TSM fears. When we talked to TSM, they said C9 is our biggest competition. We fear this team. They have the only, te the only team that we think is capable of taking us down in a best